aligned with our mission to embrace, educate, and empower every student to innovate, serve, and lead. Tonight, the administration will be presenting information to keep you up to date on our strategic plan. Thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. Our first item this evening is a moment of silence. And as we recently heard of the loss of a student, I'd like us to hold that family and friends of that student in our hearts this evening. This is an unimaginable loss and an unimaginable time of grief for that family. And just uh, let's come together in a Durham way to lift them up as we observe a moment of silence. Thank you all. Our next item is agenda review and approval. We have additions or changes to the agenda as presented. Yes, can I add a superintendent's update um, to the agenda? Can go maybe after um, public comment. So we'll add that as our new item six and bump everything else down. Definitely. Anything else that we need to include this evening? If not, yeah, I, I would approval. welcome. I move, I move approval of the agenda as amended. Okay. It's been moved by Mr. Lee and seconded by Ms. Lewis that we approve the agenda as amended. I'm gonna start with the birthday girl, Ms. Lewis. Ms. Sumstead? Aye. Mr. Lee? Aye. Mr. Sears? Aye. Ms. Valladares? Aye. Thank you. And I vote aye also. It passes unanimously. That brings us to the next item, approval of our board work session minutes from July 16th. Move approval. A second. second. <laughs> it's been moved by Mr. Sears and seconded by Ms. Valladares that we approve the July 16th work session minutes. Let's start with Ms. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Umstead. Aye. Mr. Lee. Aye. Mr. Sears? Aye. Ms. Valladares? Aye. Thank you, and I vote aye as well. It passes unanimously. That brings us to general public comment. We have all received the public comments ahead of time and they um, have been reviewed. They are also posted on the website, but our chair asked that we, um, in light of um, time, give each one one minute um, this evening, and then the, re the remainder can be reviewed by the public um, immediately online. Mr. Sutterth, do you have those available? I do. Good afternoon, board members, and thank you very much. We do have, I believe, 30, 35 uh, public comments. And I will, as uh, Ms. Byer said, I will give each one one minute and they are available on the board website for the page for this work session. We begin with uh, Danielle Adams of Miller Drive. I would like the board to consider funding Chromebooks for students enrolled in the EC pre-K program. These are some of the most vulnerable students and many need interventions from birth. Not having the ability to come to school is enough of a setback, but not getting any services at all will only widen the gap between these young students and their peers at a stage when so much crucial development is taking place. My son greatly benefited from his years in EC pre-K and I credit the program for preparing him to be a kindergarten student this year. Please include EC pre-K students in the plan to receive Chromebooks and virtual instruction. Our next comment is from Katrina Morgan of Glendale Avenue. EC pre-K need and are entitled to instruction to help them build the foundational skills they need to be successful in school and in the community. Please fully fund Chromebooks so that these students can access the services they need. 
Next comment is from Courtney Hexter of Kettle Creek Way. Are you, the board, aware of the fact that our schools are not all, in fact, ready to start? Are you aware that we don't have enough devices, hotspots, that some schools have given out the devices they already own to a portion of the student population because none have been delivered to them yet? That the rest of the student population at those schools has no idea when there will be a device available for them? Are you aware that some schools in DPS have waited well beyond what is reasonable for families to announce their daily, weekly schedules? Families are understandably calling for more actual information across the district to plan their lives and being told to wait or not being responded to at all. Do you know that although this is one district and we are DPS, the disparity between schools is astounding. When a family has children in multiple DPS schools and sees how things are being handled better at some than others, or resources seem to be more available at some than others, it raises a lot of questions. If you do know all of these things, what are you doing about them? Who are you holding accountable? Where is the pressure on the state to allow for more time to be ready? And that is the end of the timer. Our next comment is Teresa Erling Man from Manchester. I understand that this school year presents challenges unlike anything we have ever seen. However, if DPS is going 100% remote for the first nine weeks, it is vital that all students have access to devices and the internet. If that cannot happen, we need a plan for how we are going to reach all of our students. With the delay of devices, meaning some students will not have the ability to start the school year off on Monday and be online, please do not allow some schools or individuals to start while others are waiting for devices or hotspots. I appreciate that delivery of equipment is outside the control of DPS. However, you must ensure access for all students. I have heard of families who only have cell phones to start the year, and that doesn't seem like it is an equitable option. The next comment is from Jared Geller of Revere Road. I am the tech champion at Parkwood Elementary. With school starting on Monday, we are still missing over 300 Chromebooks. If by some miracle they arrive tomorrow, the Parkwood staff would have to work overtime to ensure all of the Chromebooks are uploaded into our system and assigned to students so that they can be deployed the following day. This is a Herculean task that will keep teachers from preparing their classrooms and learning the new educational programs that are being rolled out this year. With the heavy stress put on all of us and the short time frame, it will be nearly impossible to start the year with smooth procedures and exemplar instruction. As a result, I could easily imagine a world, well, world where parents immediately start looking for other options to educate their children. There are many new innovative options popping up and this kind of disastrous rollout is exactly the catalyst that will permanently push families out of DPS. It is not worth it. We must push back the start of school at least one week and preferably until after Labor Day so we can ensure a smooth start to the school year for teachers, students, and families. A messy start will set the stage for a messy year, a year that is and that is the end of the minute timer. The next co uh, comment is from Marla Polanski of Cheek Road. As a teacher for Durham Public Schools, I'm overly concerned and overwhelmed at the lack of computers, lack of hotspots and lack of communications surrounding the start of school. Our community was told that there would be enough devices and hotspots to access online learning systems. Unfortunately, that is now not the case. While some students will have total and unhindered access to vital online learning, others will be left in the dark. This is an enormous equity issue. How can we start school knowing that we have students in our district who will not be able to access online learning? I believe we as a district are not ready to start school Monday and I ask you to consider delaying the start of school. We are less than one week away from the start of school and many of my colleagues do not feel ready. While there is always some stress and uncertainty with the start of a new year, this year's start of school stress is downright debilitating and unhealthy. Teachers are muting their Zoom calls to cry while others lie awake at night unable to sleep. This overwhelming anxiety is all due in part to trying to navigate a new learning management system in just a week's time. While there have been training sessions and, and that is the one minute timer. The next comment is from Liz Miller of Cleveland Street. I'm writing to urge the board to examine the practices being put in place at the school and classroom level and the equitability of those practices. Listening to the board and district leaders, as well as DPS social media channels, would leave, lead people to believe that we are well equipped to begin the school year online in a way that is equitable for everyone. As someone working in schools every day, I can tell you definitively that is not the case. We do not even have computers and hotspots guaranteed to all children who need one. That is the bare minimum requirement for beginning the school year, and until all students have access, we are not ready to begin. We also need district and school leaders to take responsibility for and provide thorough answers to the questions teachers have been asking for weeks. 
In the district kickoff and in school meetings, we are consistently sent a message that we are incompetent and ineffective and therefore require near constant supervision to do our jobs well. This could not be further from the truth, but until we receive a clear understanding of our schedules and how to reach all students from leadership, we are incapable of doing our jobs to our full potential. Stop babysitting and that's the end of the timer. The next comment is anonymous. Anyone who has been in the school building this week knows how, just how chaotic it has been. Teachers are scrambling along with administrators to ensure that students have what they need to start with remote learning. Even still, there just isn't enough time to get it all done. It would be a wonderful help if the board would vote to push the opening of school back for students. This would allow for a much smoother transition into online learning. We want to set our students up for success and teachers need to be adequately prepared. The abrupt clo closure in March led to crisis schooling. That experience could not have prepared us for what we are facing in this new phase of online teaching. We are being asked to create an entire courses, redraw our entire profession as we know it, and physically disperse materials. There just simply isn't enough time to do this right. We are scrambling and it will affect how we set the stage for this new experience for our students and families. Please allow for a little more time for us to get this right. The next comment is from Lara, Lara O'Neill Dunn of Cheek Road. I would like to express my support for starting the school year later if possible. The first day of school is a special day that teachers prepare for diligently. The delay of devices is creating a situation in which not all children have equitable access to the first day. Furthermore, the child care options for families still have yet to materialize. Many families are unable to be home with their child during the rigid times DPS has set for synchronous learning. Their children too will miss the first day. There are many inevitable problems raised by this pandemic, but some are not inevitable. DPS has control over child care and devices and the date that we begin. If we preach equity, we should, make sh we should sure make conditions are as equitable as possible for the first day of school. Next comment is from Naima Brooks of North Point Drive. Hello and thank you for your time. I'm a kindergarten teacher and I'm wondering how can we start school on August 17th when we have no Chromebooks for students, no hotspots, and no HMH materials. We are not at all ready to start instruction on 817. Teachers are struggling to keep up with and understand all the new technology and paperwork documentation that we are being asked to use. We as a district definitely need more time to get things in order. How is it that we have parents scheduled to pick up Chromebooks but we have zero to give out? The parents are not going to be happy when they show up to get their device and we have to tell them that we are still waiting on them to arrive. We need to cancel and push everything back. The next comment is from Elisha Burns of Pebblestone Drive. Thank you for your time. I'm concerned about school opening next week without all the resources needed for our students to be successful. My son's school does not have all the materials, Chromebooks, curriculum, et cetera, needed for their students because of district delays and unforeseen events. This adds stress to the school community. How can he be successful without the necessary technology and access to learning? As a parent, I would rather school start a few weeks later than scheduled and my child be fully prepared then for school start next week and my child not to be able to access his education. The next comment is from Andrea Hoff of Governor's Place. Can we please delay the start of classes back to the original start date of August 24th to give schools and teachers an extra week for schools to receive all of their devices and to try and get their devices and hotspots distributed? Forcing a start date when all students cannot participate is unfair, inequitable, and unwise. The next comment is from Cynthia Jones of Waring Street. DPS schools have presented schedules consisting of five hours of teaching and learning five days a week. Firstly, many teachers are not prepared to begin instructing students on August 17th, mainly due to having to learn the new Canvas system, teach students how to use the system, as well as inform parents as to how it works. Secondly, has anyone even considered the physical impact of time spent on a computer, radiation, vision? The next comment is from Rhonda Taylor Bullock of Willow Crest Road. Dear board members, we are not ready. Durham Public Schools is not ready. Monday, August 17th is supposed to be the first day of school and we are not ready. After public outcry from concerned parents, educators, and community members, DPS decided to shift from plan B to plan C for the first nine weeks. The former is a hybrid of some in-person and on some online learning. The latter is a 100% virtual learning experience. This, this shift required, at minimum, putting laptops in the hands of every single DPS student, 33,000 children. DPS does not have the capacity to meet this need because all of the laptops have not arrived. This is a national issue, not a local one. We are not ready. 
School, school is supposed to start Monday and many children will be left behind. Specifically, many of our most marginalized black, black and brown students will not be online with their teachers and classmates. They will be starting the school year further behind. This is not due to any fault of their own, but due to a governmental system that has not prioritized their education. Durham Public Schools leadership is doing the best that, that is the end of the timer. The next comment is from Michelle Brunner of Curlew Drive. I'm very concerned about our school starting on Monday when our elementary school is short 250 Chromebooks. How can we start when one third of our population doesn't have the one thing everyone needs? Also, the teachers aren't ready. They're in a panic. From what I've heard, they have received zero training so far on this new online platform and haven't even been given a login. It's Thursday and school is starting on Monday. How can we be so unprepared? Starting when we are clearly not ready is going to be a mess for all. We don't need to start August 17th. Let's get this right and not get off to a rough start. Also, what happened with the Chromebooks? Why did the schools get and give us parents mixed messages about whether or not they have them, will have them, etc.? Thank you for clarifying. The next comment is actually a repeat. The next comment is Rebecca Ferris of Curlew Drive. DPS, we love you and our teachers so, so much. I'm having a hard time understanding why the start date of Monday when our school does not have enough Chromebooks. We can't have school without Chromebooks. Why are the teachers being thrown into this unknown when we are online no matter what? Push back the online start date and prepare our students and teachers adequately, please. The next comment is from Elena Barnett of Intuition Circle. One, DPS Learning Center. I suggest removal of the DPS employee discount in favor of a more equitable fee structure that is only income-based. The benefit of this change is that those DPS employees who are in financial need could still access lower cost services, while DPS employees who can afford the full cost would pay their fair share. Two, Remote Work Policy 7503. I have concerns that teachers will not have access to reliable equipment while teaching remotely. The policy as written states that the employee is responsible for their own remote working costs. Low video quality, low audio quality, and computer failures all interrupt remote instruction and make it harder for students to succeed. In order to facilitate high quality remote instruction, I suggest that teachers without access to reliable equipment be supplied a reliable computer system when they are asked to teach from home. By ensuring that all teachers have access to appropriate equipment, we facilitate a better learning and working environment. The next comment is from Sarah Anderson of Inesco Circle. I applaud the steps the board has taken to ensure students' safety by enforcing remote learning for the first nine weeks. However, I have serious concerns about the elementary virtual learning schedules. I have three children in elementary schools. The schedule presented would require my five-year-old son to spend hours a day in front of the computer. This requirement is not research-based. I am unable to find a single professional organization who advocates children having this much time in front of a screen. Furthermore, the majority of parents are working full time and young children cannot be parked in front of the computer and sent off to learn on their own all day. They require help logging on, help with redirection and help completing schoolwork. We can't pretend virtual learning is exactly the same as face-to-face -face learning. I'm urging the board to set limited by grade level for how much time a child can be expected to participate in virtual learning. I'm also urging the board not to require any live instruction for elementary students. There's no way to determine when students who need support from adults in the home can access that help. Requiring rigid time students must be logged in creates a huge equity issue between students. That's the end of the timer. The next comment is from Tay Dominique of Century Oaks Drive. Why does DPS and community education think it's safe to have a learning center with an enrollment of 150 students and 50 staff at different schools? Doesn't that contradict the district's plan C remote learning option? Does DPS and community education not value the health, life, and safety of their classified workers? So the staff and students that will attend the learning center will be test dummies for DPS to see if they get COVID? The next uh, comment is from Durham Congregations, Associations, and ne Neighborhoods. Dear Durham Public Schools Board of Education, members of the Durham CAN Afford Affordable Housing Action Team have been working with residents of Durham Housing Authority communities to address the disruption of normal day-to-day -day life since COVID-19. Recently, we learned that many returning students of Durham Public Schools who live in these communities have not received the Chromebooks or hotspot devices promised by the district. After reviewing the information located on the DPS website, we noticed that each school is distributing these items in different ways. As you may know, DHA communities comprise students from many different schools across the district. We count at least 10 schools at Hoover Road Community alone. 
While many of the residents articulated their understanding that all students would be receiving a computer in hotspot if necessary, most were unaware of arrangements to receive such materials. We found this to be due to parents unaware of their assigned pickup day, parents and students not having the transportation to get to and from pickup locations, or the fact that some DHA residents do not have working mailboxes, telephone numbers, or internet access. Please inform, and that's the end of the timer. The next comment is from Ajax Woolley of Bonaire Avenue. Dear DPS board and community, I'm sure there will be no hesitancy or confusion about approving agenda items seven and eight today. Beyond that, as a Durham native and longtime DPS parent of three, I beg you to immediately develop a specific action plan to support and sustain the connection between DPS and the residents of our public housing communities, starting now and extending beyond the period of COVID recovery, well into whatever future we seek. The one-to-one -one digital device rollout experience has shown how even the temporary loss of free access to our school transportation and physical plants presents an egregious inequitable burden on our neighbors who are already struggling with the substandard living conditions and systemic oppression in public housing. We are not powerless as a community. We will stand with you as you enact bold policies to counter the pressure and sabotage from set status quo entities who fear the oncoming collapse of the system of privilege that, as the resolution in item seven states in paragraph two, unfairly disadvantages specific individuals and communities of color while unfairly giving advantages to other individuals. That is the end of the timer. The next comment is from Gwendolina Shaw Peters of Corn Crib Court. Dear DPS board and community, I applaud and stand with you today on approving agenda item eight, the expansion of the service agreement of hotspots with AT&T. As a member of Durham Can, a retired New York City school teacher, teacher trainer, principal, and most recently Durham resident, I have committed myself to supporting and aligning with those who share the same goals I have for serving the underserved communities. As a student growing up in an East Harlem project, I was afforded an opportunity to grow, learn, and become all that I could thanks to the NYC public school system. This is why I believe in Durham public schools. However, recently, Durham Can learned that many returning students of Durham Public Schools who live in Durham Housing Authority communities have not yet received Chromebooks or hotspot devices as promised. We were also informed that this community would not be receiving their needed materials until after the start of the school year due to the lack of available devices. Therefore, we would like to applaud you and stand with you today on making this monumental decision to expand the service agreement of hotspots with AT&T so that all Durham Housing Authority community students and that is the end of the timer. The next comment is from Laurel Karchner of Harrier Court. I appreciate all the work that the schools and district are doing to get things up and running. However, I do not understand why things are currently set up that kids of all ages must log in from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. The Ignite program was set up to have three hours of in-person instruction three times a week, and that was perfect. My son is a kindergartner, and he honestly loses the ability to emotionally regulate when he gets too much screen time. Is there any way to adjust this? Why can the teachers not follow the Ignite program scheduling and then schedule one-on-one -on -one or optional activities? I will always support the schools, but the scheduling should be altered, especially for younger kids. Next, we have Mac Burns from Pebblestone Drive. How can we begin the virtual school year without the proper technology needed for the students when the technology devices aren't even in the warehouses? How can they get to the schools and students that need them? I suggest that we postpone the start of school until all the technology devices are in the hands of the ones who need them. That way, no individual falls behind. Next is Adam L. of Pelham Road. I want to thank you all for all your hard work. I feel making Canvas LMS available to all students is going to allow for the teachers and students to all share a common user experience. And I believe this will make the current learning experience much smoother for students, teachers, and parents. The next comment is from an anonymous DPS teacher. Not every student has a device or internet access. It is not fair to begin school until all students have access. The next comment is also anonymous. I understand the importance of education as a parent and teacher, but if the district is not adequately ready to, due to the lack of training for teachers, lack of materials for students, then the start of school should be pushed back. I've had a conversation with a teacher for the district and to have them get ready for school in three days is rather impossible to do. Not only that, you want these kids who have not been in the classroom for direct instruction to take an EOG assessment at the end of the year. Our students and teachers are not going to retain without direct instruction. When you look at data and it doesn't reflect what they know or their potential, it will not be because the teachers didn't do their job. It will be because you have rushed the teachers into preparing for the unknown. The next comment is from another anonymous DPS teacher. 
I would like to ask the board to consider delaying the start of school to allow teachers and parents appropriate time to plan for the new virtual learning and allow time for new devices to come in and be distributed to children. It would not be fair to start school before all children have access to learning. That will only create a larger achievement gap moving forward. Next comment is from Ruhr Petrea from Carolina Avenue. I have grown children educated in Durham Public Schools. I am proud of the education they received and want all children of Durham County to be as fortunate. I think their education provided the building blocks necessary for their success as contributing members of society today. I am concerned that a week ago I heard that DHA students will not receive necessary equipment to learn in our new environment of online learning. These neighbors will be the last to receive necessary equipment when, in fact, plans should have been in place for them to be taken care of first. I will stand with you in any way needed to see this goal is achieved. All the students must start the school year with necessary equipment, not just the wealthy. The next com comment is from Chelsea Bartell of Elderberry Court. I would like to respectfully ask Mr. Lee to clarify some public statements he wrote on August 11th, 2020. Specifically, Mr. Lee stated, pre-K is not a part of the public schools program and we are mandated by the state and federal governments to provide services for K-12 we have to look at those as a priority, as they are the foundation of the public school system. We all agree that pre-K is just as important as any other grade, which is why Durham is working to implement universal pre-K, but with the funds available, we have to manage the required grades first and work to provide access to pre-K as a secondary consideration. Upon being asked about federal mandates to provide FAPE to students aged 3 to 21, Mr. Lee stated, EC pre-K is, in fact, part of DPS. The general seats are not. Despite stating that pre-K is just as important as K-12, Mr. Lee made it clear that pre-K is the last priority for funding. Additionally, the repeated insistence that pre-K is not part of DPS communicates disrespect for our pre-K educators and families. Even if they are not identified as E- And that is the timer. The next comment is anonymous. I am an elementary school teacher for Durham Public Schools. We are not ready to begin full instruction on Monday, August 17th. Devices have not been handed out yet, and we still have families that do not know that we are even beginning school online. Teachers were given four days to completely reinvent school with little guidance and little instruction, while trying to get in contact with families and get them the resources they need before Monday. Expectations and guidelines continue to shift, and teachers and families are the ones being tugged around. How can we confidently talk to families about starting remote learning on Monday when I can't even promise they will receive a device? The expectation is that students as young as five years old will be on Zoom for three hours straight in the morning with another two hours after lunch on day one with only a couple of breaks here and there. Families are concerned about their child being on Zoom for that amount of time. The expectations being put on school administration, teachers, families, and students is unacceptable and impossible. I especially want to highlight that EC, ESL, AU teachers and families are being left behind even more so than they usually are. And that is time. The next comment is from Alexandra Bayou, Zach Bayou of Murray Avenue. As we prepare to start school on Monday, we also recognize that many children in our community will still need physical spaces outside of their homes to successfully access their online learning. We also know that as of today, some children in our community have not received the devices necessary to learn. Community partners have collaborated to create a robust model for safe learning centers that support the remote learning provided by DPS. Our goal is to reach at least 3,000 students this fall and to be accessible free of cost to as many families as need this option. We know that many more families would benefit from such spaces. With the limited space we currently have and focus on keeping everyone safe, we must prioritize our most vulnerable children who will suffer devastating consequences from loss of learning and lack of social emotional support if they do not have a safe, nurturing space to access their online learning. For our purposes, we are prioritizing children who are experiencing houselessness or transitional housing, qualify for free or reduced lunch, have parents who work in essential jobs and aren't able to have childcare at home during the day. And that is the timer. The next uh, comment is actually a repeat. Next comment is from Brian Smith of Holloway Street. Thank you for your proactive approach to keeping students and teachers safe during this time of uncertainty. I know that our goal is for our students and families to feel safe and successful during this new remote learning adventure. I feel that we are not setting our families up for success with the first day of school being on Monday. There are many factors that have come into realization by families and staff this work week. I'm asking the board to consider to push the start of school back. 
After speaking to several families, many did not even know the first day of school is Monday, let alone that we are starting remotely. How can we expect our families to feel supported when they feel as though the schools have not communicated with them? They're hearing information through the grapevine and it is creating a lot of uncertainty in an already uncertain time. Not only am I questioning the communication that the district is providing to its staff, Many times teachers have been in the dark about various district and school-based decisions and found out through news outlets or social media, and that is unacceptable. In pushing back the start of school, staff and families could work together to get on a similar page about the start of school. It would ensure that staff had time to contact all families and, and the timer is out. And the final comment is from Angela Jones of Glen Brunea Road. I have a number of concerns regarding the reopening of school August 17th. There's been a lack of communication to parents in regards to computer distribution, obtaining hotspots, and even how the first day of school is supposed to operate. I have gotten numerous concerns from families who do not know how they will get internet, where they are supposed to pick up items, or even they should have picked the items up. As a teacher, I have my own worries that we weren't given enough sufficient time to plan on using Canvas, nor had we, the nor had, we had the time to meet school-wide expectations that seemingly came out of left field. We need to be better prepared before we attempt to launch the beginning of the school year. And that was the last comment tonight. Thank you so much, Chip. Thank you for reading those and thank you for putting them online so that everyone's um, full comment can be appreciated by everyone. I know uh, we miss being together in person and public comment is one of those times that I especially um, miss being together with our community because we feel the heart and, and the concern and the challenge that our community brings as we work towards equity for our students and teachers. Now I'd like to move to the item that we added, a superintendent's update to Dr. Mabinga. Thank you, Ms. Bayer, for the opportunity to be able to give you some updates regarding our Chromebooks, maybe some other items as well as a reaction to some of the comments I heard. Uh, let me start off by saying thank you to my staff uh, for working so hard for the past uh, few months. Um, a lot of folks do not know the work that uh, you do behind the scene, um, getting our schools ready to start uh, on Monday. I'm very grateful to have you on board and uh, all the long hours, as well as uh, some of uh, the IT folks that's been working with all the time to get us to a better place. Um, prior to COVID, we had about 12,000 devices, uh, laptops and Chromebooks. Moving fast forward, when we got to COVID, we knew that so next year we're gonna have to be well prepared to be able to have enough device, devices for all our students. Thank you to our board for allowing us to be able to place those orders. Pretty much back in June, we're able to purchase about 20,000 devices. So our plan was pretty much getting those 20,000 devices in one time, we should be able to take care of all our students. Unfortunately, it's only until probably today or yesterday that we're able to get about 13,900 devices. 6,000 of those, we were told that uh, they're not going to arrive anytime soon because of uh, whatever violation that uh, the company that is working with uh, our vendor that is uh, based in China, they have some violation. Um, that's the reason why those 6,000 devices were held up by the US customs. So we are working with that particular vendor to make sure that uh, we're gonna have those devices, uh, those 6,000 probably sometime around October, that we're gonna have those. So once we got that news about two weeks ago, um, we went back to what we have in the district. So we're able to figure out that so there are some devices that are maybe three years or maybe older that so we can fix them quickly, make sure that uh, our students will be able to use them until we get a brand new one that is going to arrive in October. So based on our mathematics, we knew we had enough to be able to deploy to our students. So as of today, I'm going to tell our community that we have enough based on our mathematics to have those devices ready for our students. So what's gonna happen here, so our schools, 
we told them to have a schedule to be able to deploy those devices. We knew that all 14,000, they will arrive in one time. We start receiving them bit by bit, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. So it took time for our IT folks to be able to get them ready and push them to the school. That's the reason why some of the schools, they had a schedule set up, say, hey, on Monday, we're going to deploy those devices. But the fact that we're not receiving all 14,000 one time, that's delay changes and things of that nature. My apologies because of uh, what happened and uh, some of our families did not feel comfortable. But this is what I'll tell you. As we're talking here, we still have our IT folks that are still working, deploying those devices. We hope by Monday, we should be able to get all the devices that we have to work with to get to the hands of our students. I know there have been some uh, suggestions regarding pushing back uh, the calendar, things of that nature. And I just want to let our families know, as well as our teachers, when it comes to calendar, we got to know that state legislatures, this, they are the one that set up the start date of the school. Unless we want to be defiant, say we're not going to follow those rules and let do our own thing. That's something that uh, as uh, Madam Chair uh, is going to take over and uh, our attorney is going to weigh in to be able to give us some advice as well. But here's going to be my suggestion as we're moving forward. I heard our teachers' frustration, a week of preparation or a few days of preparation uh, to be able to teach effectively online is not enough. I heard you. But at the same time, I'm going to wear my hat of uh, being a classroom teacher uh, as I'm giving my comments here, my report. Usually the first two days or three days of schools, it's a time for teachers to be acquainted with students. There are teachers that the first day, they pull the curriculum, they pull the passing guide, they're ready to teach. But I'm gonna work with our board, I'm gonna ask our board if we can find a way to compromise, to be able to get our teachers a little bit time to be able to be ready. I don't know if two, three days are going to be ready, but I'm not in favor unless board, uh, we want to talk with the attorney, make a different recommendation. I'm going to ask our schools to be able to slow down when it comes to teaching core curriculum the first three days. Let's work on social needs of our students. Let's work on activities to be able to know our students. I think usually in the past, that's what teachers have done before. There are some teachers the first day they can just get ahead and start teaching. So we can compromise spending the first three days dealing with social emotional needs while teachers, while they're gonna have some time, they can go and work on their PLC and keep on fine tuning their lessons so that day four, they should be able to teach. I heard you teachers, we're doing the best we can, but I'll tell you this, I was reading somewhere, one of the districts that I'm not gonna call the name, they are short. 80,000 devices, and they're going to receive those in about four months. They are districts that are really in a terrible shape when it comes to those devices. It's not only DPS, it's not only North Carolina, that's across the nation. There are pretty much about 11 companies that have been working with for different vendors that they've been under those sanctions, that they cannot receive those devices. We are in a better place. We strongly believe some of the equipments, the devices that we have, we're gonna work with them to fix them. By Monday, we hope to be able to give up all those devices. So hotspot, again, we're, we're working with our city and um, Duke to make sure that all these public housing, they were going to have connections. What happens, we heard probably by the end of August, that's the town Terrace McDougal, they're going to be connected then the remaining public housing is going to take time, it's going to take more funding. That's the reason why we're coming tonight to the board to be able to ask for additional hotspots. The 6,000 one that we're able to order per Dr. Monk, tomorrow they should be able to give out all of them. Once our board approve additional 3,500, 
I heard it's going to be a turnaround time of 24 hours. AT&T should be able to give them to us. And we are working really hard. We're going to work over the weekends and make sure that we're going to have those devices ready. So that's pretty much my report. I'm asking for patience, grace to our staff. Uh, one week of uh, PD may not be sufficient. Understand it. We are on the same board with other districts as well. We are not the only one. And to our parents, those devices, I said this on WRL, every student that needs a device, they're going to have one. And I don't even want to tell you how hard we have worked today calling all these local vendors to be able to acquire those uh, devices. They are all sold out. Thank you to DPS Foundation because we had a conversation this morning. They had an emergency meeting to be able to find us $200,000 so we can buy those devices. I'm working with uh, Larry Hurst, uh, Triangle Recycling um, uh, Company. He has been making a lot of calls. He's gonna help us out. He was able to find few devices as well. All I'm asking our families, please work with us, patience, give us some grace. We are working really hard and some of my staff have not had a day of vacation. So our commitment is to serve our families. When I hear about equity, that's something that resonates with my staff all the time. The reason we did not wanna deploy equipment or devices back in March because of equity. We're feeling that we're gonna be in a better place. We're gonna take care of all our babies. Everybody's gonna have those devices and hotspot is going to be based on the criteria that we came up with. Madam Chair, uh, that's my reports and uh, my staff will be presenting more and I'm going to be available to answer to any questions and concerns that our district may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mavenga. Thank you to the team that has been working so hard and also for our teachers and, and school personnel who are working so very hard to, to connect with families. We're also struggling, I know, to figure out ways to communicate with each other during these times when we have to stay distant. And so any ways that we can continue to build those bridges will be so important going forward. Ms. Bye. Yes. Can I ask a quick question uh, sure. to our attorney on the line? Around calendar law, we had a lot of calls around starting school later. What, what options do we have? You don't have an option to literally start school later, but the plan that the superintendent proposed is something that we have seen other clients do. I think some people may be calling it orientation or something that kind of starts the school year a little slower to get people a chance to get ramped up is certainly something that's available uh, based on our reading of the statute so I, I think that what he proposed is something that is certainly something that the, the board or the, the superintendent could do does that answer your question Ms. Unstead? Uh, yes, it does. I fully support us doing an orientation time period or something because I don't want to have instruction happening and all students don't have what they need. So I really hope we exercise that option. It's unfortunate that we don't have the option around calendar flexibility. Um, so please take that advocacy to our General Assembly because it's important any year, but especially in this year to be able to have that flexibility to do what our community needs. So thank you, Rob, for that answer. Ms. Lewis, I see your hand. Go ahead. Thank you. That was a great question, um, Chair Umstead, um, Madam Chair, my <laughs> chair of the meeting. I had a question if, um, and listened to considerations and I'm supportive of it as well. Uh, is this a place that I can make a motion? Uh, Dr. Vimega, are, are you expecting full discussion of this idea about start of school now, or will it come later when we have more discussion and more topics? Um, it's uh, your pleasure, but I'm not asking for any votes on this. Uh, if uh, by consensus, if we can all agree that uh, we're going to leave this discretion uh, to our principals, the first week we want you to do orientation, work with your staff, to make sure that so they're working with students, they need to know their families and they need to reflect on what COVID is all about and all that kind of stuff. So unless you guys want to vote, but personally I'm not asking for a vote for it. 
I don't think a motion is necessary for what he's described because it's fully, with, we believe it to be within the statutory authority for the superintendent and the school system anyway. Mr. Lewis, are you, Ms. Lewis, did that answer your question? I'm sorry, before I go to Mr. Lee. It did. I have a follow-up. I'll go ahead and uh, let Mr. Lee ask. Uh, Mr. Malone, um, does does this orientation period affect the um, um, ADM count? I mean, it should. This is a day of school. It's just that the school system is using it in this method. So it, it should not. I mean, it's, it is the first day of school. It's the first week of school. Um, so I don't I don't see why it would. Uh, it's on Mr. Lassour. In regards to the question, uh, Mr. Lee, of does it affect ADM? In general, school starts off slow. Students continue to come in over the first 20 days. Really, at the end of those 20 days, your membership last day really predicts where you're going to be uh, for the state purposes of allocations. Uh, for best one of two months ADM. So it's the first and second month that is looked at for determining how the funding will be for the school district. So um, it'll be later in the month before we really know what it'll look like. Okay, thank you. Ms. Lewis. So, yeah, I do want to come back. Thank you for that explanation as well. Um, but just for for equity and continuity um, across the board, I would like us as a board to consider um, making the motion to delay um, academic teaching until I would even give it a date, Thursday, August the 20th, knowing that there is a short turnaround um, for devices to be in every student's hand on Monday, but that we can ensure that devices are there and that everyone across the district is in alignment and understanding um, what, it, what the pleasure of the board is, again, to make sure that the community is, knows that we're all on the same page, no matter what school you're in, this is a standard and expectation. So let me see if I can repeat that. You, you were actually wanting to push the start date of school till the 20th with, with a motion? Uh, no, to, to delay academic teaching until Thursday, August 20th, so that we can ensure that the device is in every student's hands and that we are at the district um, aligned together with this understanding. So my question on, on changing the start date of school in that way would be, do are those days that would have to be made up during the, the calendar some other way? Work days that we would have to move? Is that- um, I'm not asking. I'm sorry, that's, I'm not, let me clarify. It's not to start okay. school on Thursday 20th, but to delay academic teaching and to use August 17th through August 19th as orientation. So school will still start on the 17th, but we are being clear as a board that that is an orientation time frame, so that everyone in the district is aligned and understanding what is just being discussed right now. I see. And then, let me see if I see other hands. I, I wish I could move you all so that you're all in a clump on here. I've got to improve Zoom. Um, other thoughts as we continue this important discussion? Ms. Umstead. Um, I support that. I don't know if it needs to be a motion or just Dr. Mbingo for you to hear that really clearly from the board. I um, love our principals. I think leaving the, that discretion up to them might mean that some folks start and some people do not. And we may not actually make sure that devices are in every hand. So I prefer to wait um, collectively as a district that we are doing that orientation for those first couple of days and that we all start together once devices, and that is a Chromebook and a hotspot if you need it, is in the hand of every student. So right, I know that uh, legislatively or, or statutorily is in the superintendent's um, discretion, but I, I want to present as a board that that is, would be my expectation. Madam Chair, I can assure you that uh, I'll be glad to send an email to all our principals on Monday 
no, no, I'm sorry, tomorrow, to make sure that the first week is going to be building those relationships, those connections, and no academic instructions should be taught. And I'll make sure when I send it to everyone and I will copy my board as well. So Dr. Mabenga, I think here you saying the entire first week, um, which is different than, than what Ms. Lewis suggested, and, and you're comfortable with that as, as far as the amount of time that, that will be dedicated. And That's Ms. correct. Wade? I think coupling that with uh, the stress level from our teachers as well, that's going to give them additional week uh, as they're tweaking and uh, they're working on their lesson plans. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Valladares, did I say you come off mute? Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to share that this is um, this is about rolling out our, our school year with consideration. And so I, I really appreciate um, Ms. Trevania's uh, uh, suggestion and, and also like her plea for, for equity and, and how we're rolling out. So, and thank you, Dr. Mubenga, also for um, being open to that. And I think everybody here just understands that there's, you know, families that still need their devices and a lot of different things that in terms of information, I think communication, um, we can never over communicate. We, we still need to communicate. And for those families that we read that, you know, don't know that August 17th is a start date, you know, let's, let, let's, let's, let's put that date out, but with the consideration that we will be, um, with, with the, with, with the, the information that we are going to be considerate. Um, as, as students start that first week. And so thank you for that. Any other thoughts and discussion? It, I didn't hear, I, I, I don't think we need a motion, but I do wanna make sure I'm open to anyone's thoughts and ideas while we're on this important topic. Uh, Ms. Fire, I mean, I, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm still a little confused. Um, could I try to marry the two? I, Ms. Lewis, I completely understand the intent, and you know, if the administration agrees, I'm, I'm on board for that messaging about when academic construction will begin. And are we going to overtly communicate that? Do we have agreement on that so that when we leave this meeting, we know that a robocall will go out? Um, that's what I'm not clear on. Um, I don't want us to think we're doing one thing and that it doesn't happen. And it, I realize this borders on micromanaging the administration, Dr. Momega, um, but give, given that equity concerns, I think the community is asking for some clear statement here. I agree, uh, Mr. Sears. Um, Mr. Sadef, do you want to step in? And uh, I don't want to put you on the spot. Can you tell the board what's our game plan for communicating this? And I just As, want to make sure that it's going to be clearly stated that the school start on the 17th. Right. So what I am hearing is that school does start on the 17th, that it will begin with an orientation week. I am going to, I'm, I'm, I'm we need some administrative uh, discretion, I believe, as far as the wording, but I see uh, opportunity for teachers to prepare for academic instruction and for schools to provide social emotional learning and orientation opportunities for our students um, and that we would uh, and that we would communicate that uh, through a robocall uh, this evening as soon as as soon as the decision is made with follow-up communication by email to principals and written communications uh, to families and on DPS website uh, uh, to follow afterward. And uh, I did just receive a text message from one Pablo Friedman. I heard a robocall might be in order tonight. Rest assured, I am here. Um, so, um, so um, as soon as we have the clarity administratively and from the board level, as far as exactly what that first week will entail, we can send that, uh, that communication. Um, no, no earlier than we have that clarity and no later than we can uh, turn, out, turn around that information um, and have it in parents' hands and ears at a reasonable hour. I saw a question from Mr. Lee. It's not really a question. Uh, no, I don't really have a question. I would just like to uh, request that if, if we're having this orientation week, 
um, I would uh, like to request that we try to get, you know, a full student all the way through the teacher uh, test for each student, you know, like uh, being able to log on, access the applications, you know, connect to Zoom, all that works, check, you know, you know, Cameron's set, okay, good. Okay, Nicholas is set, cool, like that. And then we come back on academic day. So um, this way we have, we test our IT systems, bandwidth and everything like that all the way through. So when we do hit the ground running, we're actually running instead of starting to go through those IT issues. So the, this orientation days are not just kind of hanging out and, uh, oh, we got three more days to, to relax. And I don't, exp I don't think that anybody would do that. I'm just saying this is a perfect opportunity to test our systems, test our connections, our passwords, you know, uh, that single sign on, all of that stuff. Let's do, uh, let's make use of these days to test all of that. So when we open up the classrooms, when we start this, nobody's saying, oh, well, how does this work? You know, so let's, uh, however that communication happens, um, I would really love for us to use this, this orientation days as uh, system, uh, system testing days. Thank you, Mr. Lee. I see Mr. Sears. Yeah, so, you know, I'm going to go out here and I'm and, and Rod, correct me if I if this is is out of order and, and board. You know, we can vote this down. But um, if if I'm hearing consensus around a week, you know, I, I would like to make a formal motion. I am making a formal motion that we call this orientation week, so that it's clear not just to families and as you work with your administrators um, that that we're not going to be slipping in inequitable academic instruction. Um, Please don't take that as a sign of distrust. Just take it as a statement on equity. So that is my motion. There's a motion on the floor. Does it have a second? I have a I'll comment. Second. Um, Seconded by Mr. Lee, but go ahead, Ms. Bayadaris, if we can continue yeah, discussing. I guess like for me, it's, it's, um, it's just a realization that uh, the schools that started early um, have been working hard and around the clock and, and having to navigate all these things. And, you know, to whatever extent that we can also offer it and we can be inclusive of, you know, the, the four schools that started really early um, that are still, you know, navigating this. I mean, they're the best ones for us to kind of see like what it takes to get our students on board with, with the online learning, um, that this could include them as well. Whatever considerations we can give to our early schools um, that we can also include them. As, as much as possible. And so um, just wanted to put that out. And I would only say on those, and that's that's an important question to, for administration that they are on calendars with the community college and with North Carolina Central and um, I think that's a good point, Ms. Bayer. That, that's an important point. We don't Are there want... thoughts and hands and discussion? I don't know who I just heard. I'm sorry. We have a motion on the floor and a second. Are we ready for a vote on that? Can we uh, repeat the? Uh, although I seconded it, <laughs> can we repeat the motion just to, just for clarification? No, 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 we can't do that. Uh, I, <laughs> um, I believe I moved that we um, <clears throat> uh, call this week universally an, orient, an, an orientation week, both in our external messaging and direct the administration um, to use that internally, so that we don't have. Uh, inequitable academic instruction happening at some schools and not others. I'd like more discussion. I move for more discussion to see how we can also include those schools and, and just, just to check, it doesn't have to be the same time frame, being that they started earlier, but we do have to have some consideration for those schools if they need, you know, extra days for, you know, the, 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 the orientation aspects or onboarding or um, students who don't have devices or whatever it is that they can also have that flexibility. 
and it may not be the same time frame. I understand that, you know, we have schools starting on the 17th that could have one week. We had schools that started earlier that also needed and, and still need consideration. Uh, Ms. Lewis, sorry, I fired him. Thank you, Ms. Valladares, for the considerations. Um, in regards to the conversation we've been having with the August 17th start date, um, with this motion being on the floor and having been seconded, would we move forward with this motion and potentially create another motion that would consider the four schools in discussion that we haven't talked about yet? Can I let the comments before you are both uh, while you stay having the discussion? Um, just for your information, uh, the four schools, um, they have all of the students have devices. Um, for whatever consideration that you guys may have, uh, if you give me the authority to be able to have a conversation with those four principals, whether or not they need uh, a breakdown since they already started a week now, they're going really well. If they're going to need any flexibility to be able to use a day or two for orientation, I think uh, that will go a long way. Things have been going really well for those four schools. They have all their devices and uh, they hit the ground run. Just for your own consideration, if you can give us a little bit of flexibility for those four schools, uh, to leave it up to those four principals, I think uh, that will be helpful. Thank you, Dr. Mubenga. Other board members with thoughts and comments? I did, Ms. Lemstead, I saw you come off mute. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I just also want to say thank you, Ms. Valladares, for that um, consideration. I, and also a huge shout out to all of those small schools, staff and principals and teachers who really worked hard to get started last um, Friday. We know you all have been in school for a while and, and almost testing out what this online learning is. So please don't think that we don't see you. We see you. Um, we're excited about the work that you've done so far and really appreciate the hard work that's been done so far. And, you know, I, I heard the urgency that my colleagues expressed for communication and communication to go out tonight. I'd almost rather um, you guys take till tomorrow and get it as tight as you can because I want families to understand actually what they can expect. I know some families have looked at our online schedule. We've had some families say it's too much screen time. We've had some families say it's not enough. You know, I want families to know kind of if it's a soft start and orientation week, what they can expect next week as, as part of that. So I want you guys to make sure you take the time to, to get clarity in that messaging because, um, those questions are going to come um, very quickly if they don't otherwise. Dr. Moving, I really appreciate you having the flexibility to, to listen to the community and the concerns from our own staff and um, give them give them this time to, to start the year right. Um, I guess we had, oh, Mr. Sutter, sorry. sorry. Um, I'll, I will plan on, because this meeting is happening online and it's happening in real time and is being live tweeted by some people. Hello, Ms. Bartell. Um, um, I think that we will need to get some level of communication out officially quickly because the grapevine is already very active. Uh, but we'll provide general we'll, we'll provide general basic information, um, you know, level level one and then follow up tomorrow with the details and we'll tell people be aware and there will be more details tomorrow. I just do feel like because this meeting is happening in real time in in public that we need to acknowledge um, what's what what has been said and promise more detail as rapidly as we can. Ms. Bay, if I can also add, I really want to be clear with our staff as they're watching. Uh, as we're talking about orientation, the first 10 days is going to be crucial for us to be able to take attendance. So attendance is really required for uh, the first week as well, because that's a part of our ADM. We really need to get paid. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mavinga. And thank you everyone for a very thoughtful discussion about these important issues. Are we ready for this vote? I, I will look at nodding as a sign of readiness of at least bringing this to a vote. Yes. Um, here, seeing no uncertainty, um, the motion is on the floor. All in favor? Uh, Ms. Lewis. Aye. 
Ms. Umstead? Aye. Mr. Lee? Aye. Mr. Sears? Aye. Ms. Valladares? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Thank you all, it is a unanimous vote. That brings us to the item, USDA waivers. In your packet, you all will find um, a letter and um, you all have received some, I think this was an item that I added, so I'm trying to, um, to bring that forward. You all know that um, the waivers that have allowed us to feed students have expired and districts all over the country are struggling to figure out how in virtual environments we're going to continue to feed our students during this pandemic. There's a draft letter in your packet that I hope that our district could take a quick vote and sign on to. Um, have you all had a chance to review it? It goes to the Secretary of the Department of Agriculture and there are multiple signatories. It actually already has been mailed, but I think it would be important for us to go ahead and add our voice to it and have it added to the website. So our families that are interested in advocating um, know some of the important relevant facts on that issue. I don't see a reason to read it aloud, um, but I would welcome discussion or a motion on that item. I would move that we sign on to this letter and, and send it to um, the appropriate authorities. I second. Thank you. It's been moved by Ms. Umstead and seconded by Ms. Valladares so that we sign on to the letter to the USDA. Any further discussion? Okay, then we'll, we're ready for the vote. Um, Ms. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Umstead? Aye. Mr. Lee? Aye. Mr. Sears? Aye. Ms. Valladares? Aye. And I vote aye as well, it is unanimous. Thank you all. That brings us to the resolution, racism is a public health crisis. Um, I know that so many of us are in favor of passing this quickly this evening, but I don't know if others want to speak on this topic. It's super important to, to us in our community. I'm looking at my screen. Ms. Umstead, did you add this to the agenda? I did. Um, this resolution came to us from uh, Dr. Wanda Boone, uh, Together for Resilient Youth. Um, she's also the, the Health and Safety Chair of the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People. Um, and this has been adopted by the county and the city. So she also asked us to sign along. I feel that it aligns with our, our mission and the work that we do here in the district. And we recognize that health is so interconnected, um, especially right now. So like that's very evident, but we know that that's so interconnected with the work that we do, so. Ms. Simpson, did you want to read it aloud or did you want to just pass it? What's your pleasure this evening? I, I would move to pass the resolution um, and it'll be available on our website so that folks are able to read it. I saw some nodding heads of wanting to read it. I thought Ms. Fayaderas, Ms. Lewis, I think there's excitement about reading aloud. If you guys don't <laughs> mind, <laughs> that's not um, what I was saying. <laughs> oh, that wasn't what you were saying. No. I thought, okay. Was, I'm seeing I'm seeing all of you, and I don't know if y'all are all seeing each other. Miss Lewis, what were you saying? I was just saying I chair Umstead, but I definitely wanted to speak to what it says um, because I don't want to make light of the moment. That's what I was gonna say. But um Ms. Vidari, yes, uh Vidari, I don't know if you want to read it or not. I think we should. I, I think this is a very important moment for our community to hear that this district does uh, you know, understand that um, resilience, trauma, you know, the socio-emotional is very important. And I think that um, you know, this has been work for many years. I, I know that um, Dr. Wanda Bloom has been working with Tribe, with youth for so long. There have been many people who have been asking um, whether our district is trauma-informed, right? And this is like our opportunity to, as we sign on to this, you know, to be able to share this with our families, with our community. Um, I think that you know, racism as a public health crisis. Um, 
and all the impacts that it shows on there, whether it's inequities in health um, and access to resources and all that. I think um, it's it's not a long it's not a long thing, but I think that um, I mean I would I would love for us to read it. It's 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 a page and and some so. All right, if you don't mind, um, Ms. Lewis, it's your birthday. Can you start us off? And we'll go in the same order that I've been calling on you all in. So I've been going Giovanna, Bettina, Mike, Matt, Alexander, and myself. And we'll just cycle through it until we finish it. Thank you so much. And I appreciate uh, Dr. Wanda Boone and her leadership on this. Um, and so it begins with resolution, racism, a public health crisis. Whereas the American Association of Pediatrics calls racism a socially transmitted disease passed, through, passed down through generations, leading to inequities observed in our population today. And whereas racism unfairly disadvantages specific individuals and communities of color, while unfairly giving advantages to other individuals in white communities and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. Durham County's collective prosperity depends upon the equitable access to opportunity for every resident, regardless of the color of their skin. And whereas historically white supremacy and the socioeconomic context refers to a system in which white people enjoy structural, uh, a stru structural advantage, privilege over other ethnic groups on both a collective and individual level. And Matt, you're still on mute. Sorry. Where racism is a social system with multiple dimensions, individual racism that is internalized or interpersonal, systemic racism that is institutional or structural, and is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks. And Whereas pregnant African-American women experience stress related to the likelihood that their children will have future negative encounters with police and that stress from negative youth police encounters is associated with depression and. Whereas, whereas, the, sorry, sorry. <laughs> whereas the racial achievement gap, which refers to disparities in test scores, graduation rates and other success metrics reflects the systemic impact of historical trauma and ongoing impact of racial trauma on communities of color, strategies for addressing racial trauma have centered on affirming and validating individuals experiencing traumatic stress reactions and. Whereas extensive peer reviewed research demonstrates that this history has had a lasting detrimental impact on the educational outcomes of black students and other students of color through curriculum, discipline and school climate and Whereas the district seeks to reduce the effects of structural and systemic racism defined as a system in which pub public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, and other norms work in various, often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequity and. Whereas school age children, six to, six to 12th grade, uh, no, six to 12, 10, to view media coverage in personal terms, worrying that a similar event could happen to them. This can lead to preoccupations with their own safety and that of their friends, which in turn can lead to distractibility and problems in school. And? Whereas students 13 to 17 may become fixated on events as a way of trying to cope or deal with the anxiety that they are feeling as a result while older students may be exposed to a wide range of images and information via social media as well. And. Whereas the Durham Public Schools Board of Education stands with the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People and residents of Durham now, therefore, I'm gonna continue, be it resolved by the Durham Public Schools Board of Education. That racism is a public health crisis affecting our entire school district. Two, work to advance Durham Public Schools Board of Education as an equity and justice oriented organization with the DPS Board of Education and its staff leadership continuing to identify specific activities, to further enhance diversity and to ensure anti-racism principles across leadership, 
staffing, and contracting. Number three, promote equity through all policies approved by the DPS BOE. Number four, enhance educational efforts aimed at understanding, addressing and dismantling racism and how it affects the delivery of human and social services, economic development. I apologize for that background noise. Number five, support community efforts to amplify issues of racism and engage actively and authentically with communities of color wherever they live. Number six, to always promote and support policies that prioritize the health of all people, especially people of color, by mitigating exposure to adverse childhood experiences. Number seven, encourage current racial equity training among all community partners, grantees, vendors, and contractors. And number eight, identify clear goals and objectives, including periodic reports to the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People and community to assess progress and capitalize on opportunities to further advance racial equity. Thank you all so much. Do we have um, a motion on this item? I move that we um, pass this resolution. Second. It's been moved by Ms. Valladares and seconded by Ms. Umstead and Ms. Lewis. Any further discussion? If not, we will uh, vote now. Ms. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Umstead. Aye. Mr. Lee. Aye. Mr. Sears. Aye. Ms. Valladares. Aye. And I vote aye as well. It passes unanimously. Thank you so much to Dr. Boone for bringing this to us and the Durham Committee. We look forward to seeing it on our website soon. This brings us to item eight or nine, however we're counting, the updates on the Consolidated District B vacancy. I'm gonna turn that over to you, Ms. Umstead. Yes. Um, Nicole has some slides that she's gonna bring up. So one, thank you to all the community members who applied for the seat. Um, we had 10 applicants and we have sent that information over to the Board of Elections to verify um, the eligibility of the applicants. Um, but I will go ahead and list our names now. Once we receive that information back from the Board of Elections, we will um, make sure that those application materials are available on our website. Uh, that was sent this morning and they have assured us they're going to be working on that um, quickly. So the applicants are Nancy Cox, Luke Derry, Micah Jeter, Antonio Jones, Talisha Joyner, Frederick Raven, Millicent Rogers, the Reverend Dr. Fatima Saleh, David Vani, and Chris Wilson. So thank you all for your interest in this seat. Um, and we're gonna talk about the next steps in this process. Um, board members, thank y'all for also entrusting me for sending, you sent me some really great questions and I saw some themes that came out from those questions. So you'll see three were board operations, equity and community engagement. And these are the questions that I propose that our candidates prepare a speech, something under 10 minutes um, to address those three categories. So you'll see board op that board operations, equity and community engagement. So I'm gonna stop at that part and I'll get to the in-person portion later. Does anyone have any questions or concerns about the speech that will answer those three topics? Thank you, Madam Chair, for putting those together. So Ms. Umstead, is it your proposal that they would have one speech that would be 10 minutes at, at longest to address all three of these major topics? Yeah. Okay. You give hard homework. 
you know, this came from the board, I will say. <laughs> so we are, I think, rightfully so, looking for someone who's ready to jump in and contribute to the work. We have a lot of hard work ahead. Um, and so these questions, again, are from where I think our heart is and thinking about what we need for our district. Uh, right. So barring no other, other um, conversation on those, we talked about having an in-person uh, virtual question. And so one of the ideas would be that one of the topics below will ask um, applicants to have an idea that they'll present on something very short. What is one thing that we can do um, as we're navigating these topics? And I know there was a, a interest in having it kind of be on the fly. So applicants maybe would not know which topic that they're going to get, but they have a general idea of what we'd be looking for. Um, this is open again for discussion on if we think that's a good part of what we want our practice to be for the appointment process. So would there be a way to have them get a random topic like using random generator? I think that could be interesting. And it, I guess I would ask if it's problematic if different candidates get different questions on that. I mean, I think it's our it's our process, so we c we could. If, if the topics are public, I, and they have time from now till then to prepare, I can't see how asking randomly is unfair. Can you repeat that? I didn't hear you, Mr. Sear. I apologize. If if the topics are public, which they are in this meeting, and I'm sure we would communicate them, then I can't see how asking them randomly to speak about one or another, if it were a true random process, is um, unfair. Perhaps we have to define a true random process, such as you pull them out of a hat or a bowl in real time, Bettina. I, th I think the only thing that concerns me from the list is that I think you have community engagement on there as a second on there twice. Is that, was that intentional or um, see it as an in person and a... It could be either one. It was intentional. I think there's always more that we could talk about around community engagement, but um, I'm open. I think I'd put a charter school question in. I didn't see that re reflected anywhere here. That might be one that would be interesting to throw into the in-person questions as well. So I will add that, um, barring no other discussions, we'll put this together and send this out to all of our applicants. Um, we have selected August 20th, which is next Thursday um, as the day for these interviews. So we'll make sure that we have the Zoom. I'll work with um, Ms. Smith to make sure we get everyone Zoom logged in and ready to go. I also wanna say all the applicants information will be online. So board members, as we go through this process, you're also able to reach out um, and community members are able to reach out to those applicants as well. If you have additional questions. Natalie. Um, let me, let me think how to phrase it. Sorry. I raised my hand before I actually thought it through all the way. I think I was actually wondering if we'd set a time for this, Ms. Amstead. I, I've, all of her, is it an evening? Or have we set a time well, and are we? I'm not sure that we have. I'm open to four or five. I don't know, board members, if there's a preference at five o'clock. Five o'clock works for me. Um, if we have, if we have a ten-minute speech and we have this question, we have ten applicants. Um, that can make for a long evening, and so um, I'd say five o'clock because it's gonna, it's gonna. And then, and then there's obviously going to be some time in between, right? As as we move, so I'm we're, we're looking at about 20 minutes per candidate. So um, 
let's uh, five o'clock will be fine. For me, for me, that's, you know, it's me. Uh, Ms. Lewis? I agree. Uh, I agree with Alan, um, Mr. Lee is saying as well, and five works for me. And I wanted to know if we wanted to put a time limit also on the in-person question. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I, I would say two minutes. Let's keep it brief. And the in-person question will be random. I was hearing what Matt said, but I wanted to be clear. It will be yeah. random area topics. Okay. Um, Could, this is getting in the weeds, I know. Could we ask the administration to investigate if we can get an on-screen timer uh, worked out for that, both for the 10 and for the two, and test that so we're bug-free? can do that. Nally, did you also have a question? We had talked previously, we had talked about um, encouraging candidates not to watch other candidates' interviews in real time, it, just, um, just so they'd all bring their own authentic voice to each conversation. And so there's different, you know, there's no advantage. I don't, I don't think there's a way we can prohibit it, but uh, I think it would be nice to at least suggest that they um, wait until after their own to start watching their, their you know, the other folks. Um, I don't know how to word that, but I'd be interested in that. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I would leave it up to the candidates, honestly, um, to decide. I think the way having the random in-person question was kind of the way that we wanted to see how folks might respond. But um, I think I would leave that, that um, decision on the candidates. And I believe that each one of them are going to bring their unique perspectives um, to their questions. Yeah, um, I agree with um, as I'm said. So uh, the t the speech is just going to be open, you know, it, it, for anybody to watch. I don't think that it, I don't think it will influence any of the other candidates. And the only part that we were really talking about being in uh, um, the only part the only part we were talking about candidates not seeing was the question, you know, the uh, you know, the random question, you know, for just general conversation. Um, but since we decided to give the subjects of the random questions and it'll be a random question coming out, um, uh, I don't think watching someone answer the question would give anybody else an advantage of, of seeing it because they're the you know, random questions. They, it's not like it's the same question that everybody gets. And so if you watch it, you kind of be prepared. You, know, you kind of have to be prepared for any of these subjects that we have um, and whatever the question is within those subjects. So there's no advantage of not watching another candidate because you're not being prepped. You're not getting, you're not, the first person is not as, is not um, disadvantaged to the second person who might have seen the same, the, uh, the exact same question. So I think we're okay. Uh, at least in my mind on that, uh, on that front with candidates watching other candidates. Okay, I've got all that feedback. Do we have any other um, items that we want to discuss on this? So who are we going to talk more about the rest of the timeline? Or is this the time to do that? So the rest of the timeline, I think we outlined as the 20th being the interviews, and then on August 27th, we would make a decision um, at our large board meeting. Would we expect the appointed person to be uh, sworn in at our work session in September? 
Yes. Okay. I'm going to get them started as, as soon as possible. That's right. All right. Do you have any other discussion? Okay. So, um, we in this process, there are six of us that are voting, and um, for the uh, to appoint and. Um, they were kind of speaking with Natalie and uh, you, Bettina, also uh, as well. Hadn't really gotten to speak to others. It's the uh, we do have other organizations in the in Durham who are looking at the possibility of uh, endorsing specific candidates, and um, there's a thought. So previously, when we did the did uh, Miss Umstead's appointment, none of the PACs in Durham did any endorsements because there's only six of us that are uh, there. There are six of us that are uh, voting, you know, for the for the seat. Uh, generally, endorsements are are to inform the general public who can't do vetting, who can't necessarily do vetting of each candidate of each race and so forth. This is a little bit differently, different. And so um, Natalie wrote a, a, a letter that I think we should consider in asking you know, the organizations across Durham not to make a specific endorsement in, um, in this race simply because I believe and, and I, I fully believe this that um, it can it's it could cause confusion uh, in this process itself. So, you know, have ten candidates. There's six of us that are voting, and um, I think it I think it starts to cloud the cloud the water when uh, we have uh, organizations. Uh, competing for for these endorsements uh, is, is my opinion. I I uh, I think we should consider to let the uh, sending a letter to the different packs. Um, again, like I said, when we did Ms. Umstead's seat, there were no endorsements that were made. Um, I remember speaking specifically to the different organizations uh, throughout Durham about that, and everyone agreed. That was the best path. Now, this in no way, there's no way that uh, we can stop anybody from making an endorsement. Uh, but I think it is important to at least consider uh, requesting uh, so that we can, uh, so that this process can go uh, within our within our guardrails. Uh, Natalie, would you like to read that or? Uh, is it at the appetite of the board to even consider uh, such a uh, such a request? I'd be glad to read it. At least people can see kind of how it's worded and whether it's something that we would be interested in signing on to. The Durham Board of Education is working diligently to fill the District B seat vacated by our brilliant former colleague Xavier Kaysen. We are honored to have numerous qualified, dedicated candidates from Durham who have stepped up willing to serve. The board is leading a candidate selection process during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic focused on transparency for all Durham residents. All candidate materials and interviews will be available to the public before our board reaches our final decision. In recent days, we have heard that some local political action committees may make an endorsement for this vacant seat. As a board, we would like to encourage Durham PACs to refrain from endorsements for this vacancy. We have multiple qualified applicants and only one seat. It is our sincere plan to be thoughtful, deliberate, and lead a process that brings our community together as we make this important decision. 
Individuals and organizations are welcome to contact us directly via email at boe at dpsnc.net or by telephone to share their thoughts. We are listening and responsive to our beloved Durham community. And so this is just for consideration. Uh, th this is in our topic here of the uh, board seat. And I just thought I'd bring it up, uh, speak about it, and um, just get some, get your, get your thoughts. Um, thank you for bringing it up, Mike, um, Mr. Lee, and um, for composing the letter, Ms. Byer. I definitely want to um, lean on your experience, having been through this process um, previously, and um, trust your judgment on that. I think the letter is very well crafted. Um, we don't particularly. I think that I think that would be a good um, way in from our position. I would support that. I'll add that my experience from last time was uh, that it felt like an overstep. Um, and so I, I won't be supporting the letter. You mentioned your experience from last time that what was, um, could you clarify a little more about that? It felt like an overstep from the school board. Uh, yes, a, as I, as a school board member, after we had decided to do that, connected with the PACs and received their feedback on that request, it felt as if it was an overstep to me or the elected body to be trying to shape the PACs actions. And so I won't support this letter, but I just have one vote. Well, just for clarification, in our last, in the last time, it wasn't the request did not originate from the board. We did not seek out PACs to not endorse. They asked what well, they asked an opinion. We didn't say we don't want you to endorse. We didn't say that at all. It was brought to us uh, that PACs shouldn't shouldn't endorse, and that came from the political action committees themselves. Thanks for clarifying that, Mike. I my, my own communication and experience still still stands, but I, I, I understand that that was the case. I would also state that we have, um, it sounds like multiple candidates that are members of multiple PACs, and um, I'm not sure how thorough a process of, of vetting and endorsing that um, anyone's going to be able to do during the pandemic, um, and especially using you know, online technology to make those endorsement kind of decisions, I think is, has the potential to kind of alienate some of their own members. Um, and, I, you know, I know we all are going to consider every applicant thoughtfully and thoroughly. Um, so. I, um, I hear you, man. I also agree. Um, you know, there, I, that's what I was thinking. There's no jurisdiction of making this request. PACs can still, their own organized body, they can do what they want to do. But I, on the other side of that, I just hear um, we're just sharing what our request and desire would be based on experience. And um, from what you're sharing, Mike, um, keeping the process similar to what it was like last time um, so that the waters don't get muddy. Okay, um, so it's clearly not consensus and I'm not sure that we vote on this. Um, I think what we just have to do is if you support it, you know, you can sign on to it. If you don't, if it's fine. Um, I don't think this is a, I don't think this is something we would vote on. Um, 
And what do you think, Natalie? Is this something, is this a letter that we'd vote on? Or is it, you know, if you sign on to it, you sign on to it. If not, do not, you don't. You know, I think I think it could totally be something we vote on if if um, the majority of us are in favor of it. I, I don't think it binds any, you know, packed anything, uh, you know, it really just expresses an, uh, an opinion. Um, you know, one thing I've heard that the, the DAE was thinking of doing because they're they're choosing not to endorse was doing candidate questionnaires and, and putting their own questions up for the public to review in addition to what we've done. You know, I think that's another option that PACs have and, and could use at their um, discussion as well. Um, and I don't think, <laughs> nothing that this board does is gonna um, make or break what PACs decide to do. It is something that I feel strongly about would help us bring community and unity through the process to, to have this as independent as possible. And our last process turned out great, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to say I want to hear your concern, Natalie. Um, I, again, I don't think that we have the will to move them one way or another. So, just to me, just making public comment, you know, in agreement. We wish that you wouldn't, you know, trust in the process, things like that. But I, there's no public will in it. Do we need to take an action? I don't know that that's necessary because it doesn't move them one way or the other. Because if they make the they make an endorsement, they make the endorsement even with the statement. So I don't know how it helps or moves things along when we yeah. I hear the sentiment of what you're saying and I'm glad that that's out there um, for public viewing and consumption. Well, let's do this. Let's not take action on it. Let's just make it no known that um, there are some of us who are uh, interested in this. I've already spoken to a few people, but um, uh, this letter is in our, uh, we can make it in our packet or we can, uh, do something. I, I may post it on, um, um, on my pages, but, uh, I just wanted to be known that there is concern over the endorsement process and an appointed seat. And, um, um, I guess we'll leave it at that. It is, it is very important to me as well, uh, that this is, that this is said and made public. I will say one, I think that what I heard also from this letter is that people can email us and call us and contact us. And I think that is what I really want to lean into. So, you know, please do that. We want, we welcome that information. And it is the six of us though, that have to do that vote. So we need to hear from community that, that we, uh, what they're interested in. Um, and I, you know, we can't, um, dictate what PACs do, but they can contact us. And so keeping that line of communication open feels helpful. I'm gonna close out my agenda item, Natalie. Thank you all. No, thank you. That's exciting. That's an exciting update. And I know the community will be I'm thrilled to hear that there's such interest in participating in this board and, and we look forward to those questions next Thursday at 5 p.m. Let's see, that brings us to our consent agenda. We have two items on the consent agenda. The service agreement amendment with AT&T to provide monthly internet service for remote learning connectivity and an item B, which is academic contracts. And these items have been reviewed thoroughly ahead of time. They are available online for the public. What is your will on the consent agenda? I would move to approve the consent items subject to final review and approval of contract terms by the board attorney. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Uh, I'll second. And moved by Ms. Umstead and seconded by Mr. Lee. Any further discussion? I would only um, discuss that uh, these hot spots that we're buying have, have never been in question for the DHA properties. And I, I regret that press coverage was um, inaccurate and made, and made for more confusion within the community. We are enthusiastic about providing this. And I hope in the future we can get an update 
on how the city and the county can work together to get Wi-Fi interconnectivity out there and hardwired um, into those facilities. Um, any, no further discussion? I will um, move the vote. Ms. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Hempstead. Aye. Mr. Lee. Aye. Mr. Sears. Aye. Ms. Valladares. Aye. And I vote aye as well. The consent agenda passes unanimously. That brings us to the chief of staff's items. Ms. Giovanni, you're joining us with some exciting policy changes. Yeah, I am. Uh, if Ms. Smith would please pull up the PowerPoint for the 6400s, 8000s, and 9000s policies. And while Ms. Smith is pulling those up, I'll just refresh the um, our community as well and let them know that the board did begin its policy transition project back in January of 2019. We have completed so far the 1000s, the 2000s were completed in 2015. We've done the 3000s, the 4000 A's, 4000 B's, 7000 A's and 7000 B's. And we are currently um, at this point addressing the 6400 purchasing policies and the section 8000 and section 9000. And to let everyone know that we did meet with the policy working group to go over these and Dr. Monk and Paul Lasore were the administrative uh, staff that participated in this. So with that said, next slide, please. The first issue that we have is the per 60, policy 6450 purchase of services. Um, what we would like to know from the board is what amount uh, you would like to have as a uh, threshold for um, suggesting that we provide quotes. What, um, if you recall, we did have to send out um, our auditor for a uh, quote. We had had them for, I believe, either 12 or 15 years. That is generally not best practice to not bid out for these services. What this policy provides is that it's not required, but um, occasionally that we do bid them out so that we can make sure that we are allowing for competition. Um, from various members of our community and also making sure that we're getting the best um, services. So typically, like just for example, we did bid out our third party administrator um, this year for workers' compensation and we had been with them for approximately five years. And we frequently bid out our insurance usually every um, three years, but it depends on the administrator that's in charge. But we do recommend that we put in a policy that when we're spending an amount and the suggested amount is 150000 that uh, administration at least have a conversation um, within itself to decide if this is what's in the best interest of the district to send it out. And if it's not, then it, the policy wouldn't mandate it. But um, we do feel that there needs to be some uh, kind of maybe putting feet to the fire a little bit for administration to make sure that people are sharpening their pencils and that we're being um, fiscally responsible with the uh, public funds. So the Ms. Giovanni, are you wanting to go through these all the way through and then have questions or discussion at each point? I would like to do, we can do discussion at each point. I think may be the easiest for these, if, if there is any discussion. Yeah. And of course I'd ask um, Mr. Lasore, or Dr. Monk to jump in as well, if they have anything to add. But we did meet with the policy working group and we did go over these um, with them. And so this is administration's recommendation. And that, okay, I'm just looking to see if, if folks have concerns. I would just remind folks that, you, that you're off camera for, for a health reason and we're thinking of you and, and we know, glad that you're here with us, um, Ms. Giovanni. The, yes. And the 150,000 is, is the amount that you guys are recommending. Yes, but that can be raised or lowered depending on the board's pleasure. But we felt like that was a significant enough amount that um, would warrant at least making sure that we were being um, responsible with um, the boards and the public's money. So I guess it's, can you can you what? remind me who was on this policy working group and um, um, <laughs> I do so many. Or is it, it's been it's a while, perhaps. <laughs> I've been sending emails to different policy uh, groups. Um, I know Alexandra 
was on there. I think Miss Umstead. Oh, uh, and I'm drawing. I think yeah, it was just those two. That's why I'm confused. I was trying to think of the third person because um, Mr. Um, Kaysan was originally slated um, before he resigned. So it was um, Miss Viadaras and Miss Umstead on the corping group. I don't think I was on this one, Tanya. I think it was another one. It wasn't there? You go. Who? Why am I? I heard someone come off mic. Was it you, Mike? That was me. Um, uh, where was this? What what dollar figure was this before, Miss uh, Giovanni? Uh, we didn't have any a policy requiring or suggesting uh, any quotes for any, it. any limit. Yeah, okay. we didn't have it. and that's what um, I was saying. There wasn't what what do we know what level uh, board approval is just and regular purchases, uh, uh, nine, is it 100,000 or 99,000? Uh, nine, uh, nine, zero, 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 zero. Okay, nine, 90,000, okay. Yeah, so right now, like when we do, we can do services contracts for, you know, any amount anyway, but we don't have to, um, but that's why we didn't have that policy before. If you look at the first part, it says it generally does not require it. So we don't have to go through every year when we're doing services and do competitive bidding. And so what we're saying is, and what the kind of best practices are, is when you're going through those, you want to make sure that you're getting the best deal. So like I said, when we quoted out the insurance, we typically do that like every three years to make sure that they're keeping their pencil sharp to provide the services. And we've been with um, our same broker for years, but they we send it out and get different quotes from different folks to make sure that um, we're getting the best deal that we can while also making sure we're getting top notch service. So it's not just a, a pricing question. I mean, you wanna make sure you're getting uh, top notch uh, providers of the service. Okay. Um, earlier you mentioned something about auditors. Was this a recommendation from the auditors that we look at doing something like this or is it a result of some findings or no. you know, what? Uh, so it's just part of the um, policy manual transition when we got in. So this was what triggered it to some extent was kind of we had been with those same auditors for so many years. And that's just mm -hmm. really not best practices to be in the same with insurance. So I'm not putting it just on finance. I mean, we had been previously, you know, before um, I took over risk management, we had kind of been with the same, you know, <coughs> providers and hadn't looked at it and hadn't said like we just whatever they sent us, we took it. So that's really um you know, where it came from. Okay, thank you. So if there are any questions, I can move on. Don't let me know. No, I, I appreciate it. I, I like the the uh, dollar figure that you all put in there. And I think we can go back and change it if our finance staff feels it's too high or too low, but I really appreciate that. Exactly. Okay, uh, slide, please. So this is um, policy 8,000 fiscal goals. It is um, just generally kind of aspirational uh, statement. The policy working group requested that we bring it to the full board to get, get input and commentary from you regarding additional values that you may want to add to it. I believe like some of the examples that they shared were sustainability and transparency. So I would seek guidance from you on what other um, values that the board may want to add and then I would add those in and bring it when we bring it back for the next reading. I'm looking for folks that have questions or thoughts on that. Sorry, Darius. Yeah, I just uh, want to thank um, Dr. Uh, uh, um, Tanya Giovanni for this because I think um, in terms of values, I mean, it's it's a uh, sustainability, you know, transparency. These are things that. Um, are very important. And, and so just to include values like this um, as we think towards the future and um, in terms of our contracts, in terms of how we're building um, and and especially the, like knowing that we do have climate change happening, we do have to be mindful of like impact, right, on our environment and as much. So really appreciate like being able to, to navigate like 
finances and also like how to build sustainably um, and uh, efficiently. So thank you. I just wanted to comment and, and thank Dr. Giovanni for that, for including it. I was on this group. I apologize. I've been on a couple. And so I think I just forgot. Um, I could see us adding a statement here on the fiscal goals um, about making decisions that align with the district's mission and vision. I think we have laid out equity as a part of our mission and vision and, and community building. And so without um, writing every single goal there, maybe a line that says these decisions will align with um, that goes a little further than the educational goals, but aligns with our district's mission and, and vision. I think there what are and values, our core values, I think is the other statements that we use. Okay. Okay. So I can wordsmith that um, as well. Um, if there are any other board members have anything that they want to add and they think of later after this meeting, if you just want to shoot me an email and um, when I bring back the draft for the next meeting, I can include that and the board can review it. Does that sound good? Ms. Lewis, did you have a comment? I saw you come up here. I can't get my thoughts all the way together, but I was just thinking um, when I say free public schools, I just think about high quality. Um, just, I, I don't know how to, what the balance is what I'm trying to say. So I'll throw that out there, but I don't know what else. Okay, well, I, I can work, I'll try to wordsmith that in Ms. Lewis and when mm -hmm. I move um, and as I said before, if any of you think of something um, that you aren't able to think of, shoot me an email and I can include it in the draft for the board. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So this is um, policy 8100 budget planning and adoption. This policy is obviously, I'm just going to give you the critical part. It goes through um, the whole budget planning process and how it's adopted, but there is a line in the draft policy that said the board shall hold or may hold at least one public hearing on the proposed budget prior to final action. So we needed, we were requesting guidance on whether you want to make it a mandated hearing every year on the budget or to leave it in the draft language of shall. And I believe Ms. Umstead had um, lifted this up for it to be brought to the full board. And Mr. Lasor, I think um, if you can give a little more insight maybe for the board before they. Sure, so the, the policy is May. Um, and this year, as you well know, because of everything that was going on and the ups and downs of the budget, um, we didn't have an actual public hearing in that regard. We did everything else, but we didn't have a public hearing, but that was a May. Um, and we're just looking to see what the board's pleasure is in regards to having it as a shall or leave it as a may, just depending on the situation of the, the current times. I feel strongly that it should be shall. I mean, I, I, that is one huge budget that the community needs to have, you know, voice in. And we've had some years recently where we haven't heard from folks, but Boy, we've had some other years where we've heard from lots and lots of folks and it's informed our thinking so thoughtfully. Um, I'm gonna go with shall, um, mainly because over the last uh, four or five years, we have been really working towards making our budget and budget process transparent and Part of that transparency is encouraging people to come out and speak on the budget whenever we have our budget meetings. Some of those meetings have been very, very informative. Like, like Natalie said, some of those were not as well attended as we would like, but many of them have been. And to be able to offer each year the community the opportunity to come speak on the budget is extremely important. And so I would love to compel this board and future boards to continue this practice of opening up our books, opening up our our microphones and, and allowing the community to help inform us on where our budget is short, where it is good, where there are challenges and where, where things are looking good. So um, um, I'm gonna go with shall here uh, because I think it's very important 
especially over these last few years that we had a meeting and we continue to plan ahead. It is not that difficult of a process. This year is a lot different. That there, There's a lot of things that didn't happen this year that, that we generally would. But this is not a normal situation. This is not a normal year. So um, I would like I would like to change this to shall to have this at, at shall. Okay. Any other board members? We have two for shall. I support shall as well. I think it aligns with our values of transparency. So I support shall. So do I. So do I. Okay, the shells have it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, this is the annual independent audit. Kind of, as I said previously, kind of um, Sarbanes-Oxley doesn't cover us. That's um, corporations. We're not covered by that, but it does offer guidance on best practices fiscally. Um, so, what we are requesting, administration is wanting to add language that we the board require a new audit firm every three or four years. And again, I would ask Mr. Lesore to weigh in on the three or four years, if he could provide some guidance for the board. I don't want to overload the finance office with, you know, getting a new audit firm too often. So I think Mr. Lesore, if you could maybe provide some a recommendation on three or four. Years. Um, you know, every four years would be a good time frame. Um, the first year, your, your audit firm's coming in and, and looking at what you're doing and will try to provide you some assistance. I, I, but I think every four years at, at the, at the, it would be the right number. Okay. Are you satisfied with four or did you think five, Paul? I mean, I don't know that we, I think we- No, have I, don't, I don't know that you need to go to five because again, we want to, um, had, we, had we not had changeover, um, we probably would have gone out for a, a bid earlier. Um, but from that standpoint, the um, every four years would probably be good. Um, we did get significant savings in going out for the bid. And that's really what you're trying to do because audit firms um, that will be interested in doing Durham Public Schools will be quality audit firms. And uh, from that standpoint, it's just trying to get the best price possible uh, for the district. Can I, can I ask a clarifying question? Sure, go ahead. Is this intended to mean that you will solicit a firm every three or four years or actually switch firms? Because it, it reads as though you would, no matter how great the firm is doing, you will switch to a new firm every three or four years. Correct. I think that is um, what best, I mean, we can, the board can do whichever one it wants, obviously, but um, it would be the recommendation for best practices that you switch firms because um, you want to make sure that sometimes that the auditors are basically operating at a certain standard. That's why, um, as I said before, we're not governed by Sarbanes-Oxley, but that is the recommendation under best practices that you do switch. But again, it um, it is up to the board if as we had, as I said before, we've had the same ones for several years. But that is our recommendation that. Um, we do get a new audit firm. All right, thank you. I just wanted to make sure. So, Mr. Lazar, how many, I mean, are there multiple firms that do public school North Carolina accounting auditing? I mean, that, that you could have viable bids from? Yes. I mean, yeah. This go around, we had seven um, and there were probably some that didn't bid on it because of distance. But um, what I'm, we're seeing is more and more audit firms are reaching out to go a little bit further um, from their hometowns to uh, and expanding their, their firms at the same time. So um, we're seeing, we, we, I think we had seven this time um, and they were, all they were all quality firms from that standpoint. So with that, with the clarification from Mr. Lesore, um, administration would recommend four years for the language. Is there any further commentary or questions from the board? Okay, uh, next slide, please. 
So this is um, policy 8340 uh, insurance. The frequently principals, it has come to my attention that principals on occasion transport students in their vehicles for various reasons. Um, there has been a general prohibition in the district with our previous policy that, that no staff member transport students in their vehicles. So I know frequently um, there were some re requests that social workers do it. And because of the policy um, that was there, that was forbidden. And when we discussed this with the policy working group, we kind of talked through, um, should we have maintained the current prohibition against staff driving students and maybe work with um, transportation regarding like safe transport student transportation that we could work with? Or do we want to include this draft language with principals um, being potentially the only people that could transport them and that the board would provide maybe some additional, I think here the suggestion was $50 as an additional premium for them to add um, this coverage. So that's uh, the policy working group did request that we um, bring this to the full board for further discussion. I'm concerned with principals driving students. Right. And, yeah, and they do. And I think that that's kind of where the concern is. Like if there's, I mean, I've had multiple principals tell me that, that if a child gets up left, you know, like they'll be sitting there at six o'clock or seven o'clock at night, the principal will take them home. Or if something happens. So we have had that happen, even though we had the, so that's what we needed to have this conversation from uh, the board. I think if we can, we can stick with the current prohibition and just say, you know, under no circumstances, and I would be happy to maybe work with um, Dr. Mullen and our um, broker on kind of figuring out, or not our broker, but with uh, transportation and figuring out, like, I know we have student transportation services that transport our kids now that we contract with. So we could maybe um, expand that to some extent, but right now our principals are driving students on. Uh, yeah. Mr. Shears, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'd like to speak strongly on this and strongly as one board member could speak um, and, and bring in my, my day job where I, I, I manage student, student risk um, and have watched the trend around the litigiousness of decision-making um, to where we are crippled from making common sense decisions. Um, and, and I would not want to tie the hands of a, a principal to make a judgment call in an emergency. I know we can split hairs on what an emergency is and try to detail out that list. Um, but to, to take risk management to the extreme uh, where we, we can't have a principal transport a student in the back seat uh, in an emergency situation um, bothers me to my core because we, we, if this trend continues, we, we, we won't be able to do anything and we won't be able to um, make judgments that you know can can help students not just in the getting them home situation, but other emergencies uh, that may come up. So that's my two cents. I could say more about it. Um, um, yeah. Ms. Diane Harris. Yes, um, I would um, suggest that we switch the the bullets. I think that there's um, there's something about what our general um, uh, ideal situation is. Like we we don't want staff transporting students. I mean, we, we want to make sure that, you know, um, we, we want our students to, to get home safe. We want them to get picked up by parents. Ideally, we, we wouldn't want to put our, our staff in that situation. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking that if we switch the bullets and we start with administration recommends guidance on maintaining the current prohibition against staff driving students in personal vehicles. However, you know, the board realizes that on rare emergency. So it, it just it puts it as though it's not like our culture that principals are going to be driving students all around, but that in the rare occasion, in, in the case of emergency, that we, we, we're not going to, um, you know, restrict our, our principals from, from doing um, what, they, what they deem right in that moment, but that it is not our, our culture that, you know, our staff is going to, that they're going to be driving our students. Um, you know, I, I know like in terms of risk and all that, like, many different institutions put forth things that, that, you know, there should be at least two adults or there should be, it should, there should not be one-on-one, -on -one. like no adult should be alone with a child, you know, and, and that those are policies that they put into place. So it could be that we add something like the principal and another staff member will ensure that this, the student gets home, you know, like something like that. 
um, we can we can definitely talk about what what that would look like. I know that institutions like the institution I work for, um, they've even reduced uh, one on one Zoom calls between an adult and a child. You know, so it's like like you know minors. Um, in terms of minors, there's there's a lot of uh, risk and and uh, just ensuring boundaries and ensuring that there are like adequate things. But I would just say which the bullets at least it kind of puts it in that we recommend guidance on on maintaining. Um, you know, the provision, okay. but we do acknowledge that, you know, it, on rare occasions, it may be necessary. Okay. Uh, That's all Mr. Uh, Lee's hand. Go ahead. I had a, a question, um, kind of following up with what Ms. Valadares um, said. So is the purple part of the, so I think we would have to, do we need to rewrite or add something to this to um make that part of the uh, yeah. policy is, yeah. okay that admin that's that's what my go um, ahead that's me saying that's what we're asking because there's in our current policy okay. a prohibition but as we said due to okay. these circumstances so what i would do is to say in general you would, you know the board you know discourages and prohibits staff from okay. transferring students and i would wordsmith that but it realizes that okay. on the emergency occasion and then flesh that out. Is right. Okay. So I just wanted to clarify that because I think uh, what Ms. Darius said was uh, uh, what was a good compromise here, what we're doing. I just want to make sure uh, we create wording to emphasize what the administration recommends within the policy there. So I, I, uh, I do appreciate that um, both Ms. Darius and Ms. Giovanni for uh, making that connection. I would, I would also just add, I, I don't want to handcuff our, our staff at all, Matt, but I don't want females in vehicles alone with a, a male principal. I, you know, can we add that there will be, you know, two adults or something if that in that rare emergency? I mean, that, you know, you don't go in and get a, a, a GYN exam without another adult in the room. That is just best practice. I, um, yeah, I will. And, and the, the the red bullet also that red text makes it sound like this is about money and reimbursement, and I think that I don't even know that that should be in there. I, you know, it's if we're discouraging it, then you know I don't know why it would be in policy that we're paying for it either. That that seems strange. Uh, I, I I will you know ask forgiveness that I wasn't on this policy review. Despite being invited, and I, I would reiterate that minors protection is a core piece of my my work at one of our local universities, and I'd be happy to go back with Ms. Giovanni and address that very specific point, Ms. Byer, about you know, uh, supervision. And you know, I'm not sure the gender piece exactly that way, but you know, two to one supervision is vital. She raised that as well. And, um, Working in that space, also, I don't want us to go so far that I mean, if we start to apply, I, I, it's just it's a slippery slope. If we start to apply um, certain levels of risk management, we restrict our ability to educate students and provide that sound base of education. So, it's just a risk I see in trends of the litigious nature of trying to um, keep your risk low. So, I would like to take Mr. Sears up on that offer, um, if it would be the pleasure of the board that. Um, he and I work on this language with his um, expertise and then bring back um, the amended and updated policy for the board's review and consideration at the board meeting um, at the end of the month. Is that acceptable to the rest of the board? I've seen lots of consensus. Thank you, Matt. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. Uh, next slide, please. So this, this is a very detailed, I mean, it's like probably 10 or 12 pages, this policy um, regarding community use of facilities. So the policy working group wanted um, to, us to lift it up to the full board regarding how we felt about more loosely organized groups. So the policy details like formal groups that have, um, you know, nonprofit status um, that is documented or has a formal group status, such as like a PTA or a PAC or a group like that. But what they wanted to know is kind of what the board's pleasure was for more loosely organized or affiliated groups. Like a lot of community groups don't have, 
you know, the resources to, um, and if either one of the policy working group board members would like to kind of expound on this, I would appreciate it, but, um, and share your thoughts on this for, but that's kind of where we want to go. And I think, I don't, Ms. Vargas. Yes, um, I think that we are realizing, you know, um, how blessed we are in Durham. Durham has an ecosystem of efforts, um, institutions, nonprofits, and there's also grassroots. Um, they're parent-led groups. We have a lot of PTAs and um, associations and, and, and other loosely held groups. So uh, this is about not excluding um, the contributions of any specific group. I think if we start naming specific institutions, we are, you know, by naming them or by, by uh, framing it in a way, it's, it's, it's setting us on a, on a precedent of like saying that we rely on specific types when the efforts are very diverse, um, multi-class, um, multicultural, and, um, and, and just, you know, across the board, very different, you know, in terms of organization. So um, I'm very, very content with this part, which is um, just talks about uh, different types of organizations um, and affiliated groups without uh, specifying, you know, a specific institution. So thank you for that. Ms. Giovanni, does, it, does this policy go into the, and you all weren't here when we had the history of faith groups coming in and interacting with students in the afternoons and, and a lot of after school activities, and we had to actually change the policy a lot to actually have separation of church and state issues respected and um, good news clubs are, are, present, are prohibited from our schools and things like that. Does this policy cover any of that or do we need to be cognizant of that history that we've had in general? So uh, I believe Dr. Anderson's on the call, um, I believe, uh, but the most, this is generally for outside of school time use. Is that, so I don't, I'm not familiar with what your, um, the good news clubs that you're talking about, Ms. Bryant, was that during school hours that they were coming in or was it in an after school? Like this would have, this is presumed to be, presumed to be after school is completely over and or on weekends for the community use of facilities. Well, There's no that, that sounds different than th these were afternoon, um, you know, okay. community ed times when there were clubs coming in, but also kind of evangelizing and proselytizing to students. So um, as long as that doesn't. No, this isn't, yeah. that, isn't that, but, but it is, um, and I think Dr. Monk, I do see him. Dr. Monk, Dr. Monk. I don't know if you can hear. Me. I hear you. Um, <laughs> those so, things don't fall under my purview. I'm sorry. I just provide the buildings for the activity. So. I believe if you could just share with the board, I believe you had provided an amount that we had lost for, I think when you and Dr. Anderson presented on this. Um, we were Certainly. Talking about yeah. So we're, we're here today talking about the use of uh, community use because of um, the costs associated with it, um, whether it be custodial or, um, utilities or maintenance fees and things like that. And so um, though we appreciate and want our community um, to ingrain themselves in the school district by using our facilities, the, the use of those facilities are not free to the district. And so um, this is a conversation that the board needs to have um, to um, make a decision about how much of the cost for community use um, they're willing to absorb and how much they're going to ask um, those organizations um, that want to use those facilities to contribute to that. So with that, um, the reason that we're kind of lifting this up is, and I would, based on Ms. Wright Artist's comments and if pending any further comments from the board, I would wordsmith to bring back to the board kind of what those loosely organized groups and affiliated groups would mean because it's all it's a tiered level of access and f fees so that's really the primary um, purpose on where they kind of fit into that so that um, they can get the benefit kind of of the more preferred status of you know organized nonprofits versus corporations or businesses or you know for-profit groups that may want to use our facilities I have a comment about that, and this is about, you know, um, celebrating the initiatives of parents. I mean, um, a lot of parents, especially uh, in the Latinx community, um, parents who wanted to meet with the superintendent have been using the facilities and, you know, asking to have these meetings, um, taking initiative, being proactive, 
and wanting to have those lines of conversation, you know, and, and creating ways, creating pathways. So um, yeah, definitely a multi-tiered and recognizing that parents don't have, you know, uh, um, the budget, they don't have a budget, right? These are, these are uh, parents who, who really just wanted to connect with the district and want to connect with admins. And so um, if we have a multi-tiered and we recognize like who can pay, you know, if, if institutions have budgets and all that, like they can definitely support our schools and support them. Um, support the use of facilities but when it comes to like some loosely group some loosely organized groups like parents who, who want to connect who want to be able to hear um you know get their questions answered and and i applaud as many of you board members who have shown up to um these parent meetings um you know organized by parents so i think it's very important to to acknowledge like who can pay and who can't and you know in terms of equity it is about ensuring that that our facilities that we are, nothing is free. There's, there's no, no such thing as a free lunch. That's, that's the saying, but that um, in as many ways as we can support uh, some folks. And then we can also um, have buy-in from community groups that can pay and can provide, um, you know, can, can pay for the use of our facilities that we don't uh, exclude those loosely organized groups that want to use them and may not be able to pay. So we can, we can, we can figure out like what, what that would look like, but I just wanted to pinpoint that we, we have examples of what that looks like in, in, in terms of use. Thank you, Ms. Valadares. Mr. Giovanni, did we give you enough feedback to move forward in a healthy yes. way on that? Yes, what I, um, what I will do um, with the board's permission is kind of work with the feedback that I've gotten um, here and bring back uh, a new wordsmith version to include that um, for discussion at the next board meeting. Okay, all right, thank you. Next slide, please. Hmm. <laughs> so this is uh, naming facilities. And if Ms. Smith would click through like maybe three times, just so you can see what all we have to look at here, board members. So next slide, please. And then we'll come back. And next slide, like this is the entire policy. So. Uh, if you can go back to the first slide on 9300, um, this is the naming of facilities and really just kind of went through. Uh, we did not use the NCSBA version. Um, we worked with uh, various kind of parsed together different parts of other schools to see if we could get something that would be more Durham uh, friendly. And this is what we came up with. So. Um, I know we're, we're probably going to have a long meeting. I don't know, I have two more items myself after this, but uh, with the board's pleasure, I think if we could just maybe take some, a little bit of time to read through this and then get feedback. Or if you've all or don't have any comments and you're ready to adopt it, we can do that. So. I, not that helpful, but I think number one is pretty critical, having a student that attends Lakewood Elementary and using it with Lakewood Montessori. Um, okay. So it's, um, let's see. This is the easy slide here, because yeah. this is, I think, from our current policy. It's going to the next one that gets more sticky to me. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So number four, um, this is, we kind of had some conversation about like what size a group had to be. And so we really couldn't figure that out, like what that really even means, what sizable or recognizable necessarily means. I think that we just have to take that on a case by case basis because you don't want to say you have to have 10 people or 100 people um, for the nomination, but we do want to make sure that people feel like they're heard. And so that's why we, I changed it to a sizable or recognizable group. So you also don't want one person coming in and inundating one or two people inundating the naming committee or the superintendent with various suggestions. So, um, so Tanya, I have strong feelings on this and I'll just put them out there and see what others think. I love our schools that are named for people now, but I think this is new to actually 
add this. I think we had taken naming schools, huge entire schools uh, after individuals out of our DPS policy. And I think it, we did because it's better practice not to have schools named after people. And the reason I think that is they tend to be named after politicians who I think are about the last people you should name a school after. Um, so I would be delighted if we just said that entire schools in Durham wouldn't be named after people anymore. Um, that's my very strong feeling. Okay. Well, I I personally don't have a problem with, with um, the schools being named after people. I just don't want to constrict the options. Um, um, I do like, I mean, we have schools named after people. We have schools named after areas and then just schools with random names, right? Um, and after streets and everything. So, um uh, I don't, I personally don't have a problem with schools being named after individuals. Um, that is for the, the current board or superintendent and, and group to, uh, kind of go through the options. But I don't, uh, I personally would welcome all the options and then have the board narrow down to what the board is feeling at that moment or the, the, uh, the process, how the process narrows down the names. Um, I don't, I don't have a problem with um, names being included. I also um, don't have a problem with names being included. Um, it's just the rich history um, that we do have in leadership out of Durham um, and taking pride in the names. Um, of Some of the, some of the schools we already have, I think that um, I wouldn't be opposed to keeping or as it is. My question was around from you, Ms. Giovanni, um, is the recommended or sponsored through a sizable or recognizable group? Is that what you're suggesting changing the language to or you want more um, input about what that should be? So the, um, in 4A? Yes, 4A. So when we were talking about it, what you don't want is saying that the board even if someone even comes forward, right, for a new building name, what you don't want is like individuals inundating administration with suggestions, like me saying, I suggest, you know, person X, and then a hundred people do that. So what we want, and we do, in order for a nominated person to even be considered, it would have to be through a sizable or recognizable group nomination. So I think, you know, sizable is one of those things that I think you're just going to have to kind of determine, like, is that 10, probably not, you know, but, you know, is it 100? It's probably less than that. So I think it's one of those things where we just want to look at the group, kind of going back to the pr prior policy, but I don't want to maybe handcuff us. So we do have more loosely affiliated groups, right, that may not be formal PTAs or, or a group of faculty, but they still are community members that have kind of coalesced and to form a group, and they would be able to potentially nominate a person, assuming that the, the board um, adopts this policy. Did that answer your question? Yep, I, I definitely hear that, you know, keeping it general with sizable. And then my next question goes to recognizable. What is the... Um... I think, again, just um, to say that a group, if you can look at this group of people that are submitting the nomination and they've kind of coalesced and, you know, they get together on a regular basis, you know, I mean, I don't want it to be, like, again, like, I just don't want to hobble, like, our groups of folks, you know, to Ms. Viadaris's point of people that have gotten together and want, you know, to kind of form a group that have like-minded thoughts. So that's what I would say is like recognizable. So. Okay. So may not, not making that formal, like you have to have a nonprofit or you have to be this, but it's recognizable that your group is coming together and putting forth this nomination. People like, I get it. Yep. Thank you for that. That explains it. Mrs. Mrs. Byer, I, I don't if we're ready to move to the next slide or if any board, other board members have any other comments on this slide. No, I, just, I don't. Um, I don't see hands raised or people off mute. I think I think we're ready to move on. Um, I don't know what you. I mean, um, I would like to to share with people at some point in time. You know how difficult it was to name 
Lucas School, which is named after two different Lucases that are not related as the most recent example of naming schools after people that gets really sticky. And um, I just don't think it's best practice. I, I think it, it causes potential harm. I, is this notion of an individual being deceased as less than five years, so we're only naming after people of, I mean, that that supersedes that 4A, that last sentence. We're not naming a school after anybody until they've been deceased for five years. Is but that how I'm reading that? Yeah, so no entire school. Um, so like you could do an individual room for people, obviously they're still living, um, but an entire school facility would not be able to be named for any living person or any person who has been deceased less than five years. So that's the, that's the draft language um, in the policy. So if that helps so that, yeah. But anyway, I, I, I seem to be yeah. the only one that has any concern with this. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I think it's probably best to move on to the next. We've got a lot on this agenda still. Thank you. Next slide, please. I don't think this one will be that. Next slide, okay. So this one just goes through, I think, pretty standard. Like when you're changing facilities names, there was some conversation about potentially changing a name of a school earlier. I think that's been resolved, but just basically this is just um, fault that it would follow kind of the process for um, existing schools. So I don't think this one's that um, controversial. It just says it's consistent with naming a new school. All right, next slide, please. And this just establishes, as I said, this is the entire policy, um, but it just says the superintendent shall establish regulations for this policy. So um, I think once we uh, get through the policy adoption, then we would start on those regulations. So are there any other questions about the naming facilities? Okay, uh, next slide, please. And the last one is we are holding for the final cleanup of facsimile signatures. Um, our current policy just addresses um, faxes and not emails and e-signatures, which as we all know is the primary way that we sign things. So um, when we talked about this uh, with Mr. Lasour also, uh, we wanna make sure that we are um, legally compliant on that. And we just didn't have um, all of the input that we needed to bring the facsimile signatures and the e-signatures um, to you. The draft we got does not address um, electronic signatures. So we need to do some research and bring that back to the board with cleanup. Next slide, please. Okay, I believe that I have all the guidance that um, I need for this um, set of policies and I will um, bring them back with the um, updates and amendments for the board at the meeting at the full board meeting at the end of the month. Thank you so, so much, Ms. Giovanni. It is tedious work, but it is so, so important. And I appreciate your uh, willingness to listen to all of us and, and incorporate that feedback. Um, is the next item yours as well, Ms. Giovanni, the Title yeah. IX policies? Yeah, the next two. <laughs> so this one should not take as long. Um, in May of 2020, the Department of Education and Betsy DeVos um, drafted new regulations around sexual harassment and they slated those to go into effect um, tomorrow. There is, um, the Attorney General has filed a lawsuit in North Carolina and around the country um, objecting to that, but those haven't been ruled on. So we have to have these, in order to be compliant, we have to have these policies adopted and do all of the things that they say we have to do, which includes um, posting our training. We have to get training for our staff under these new regulations. We have to include all of the trainings we've had on our website. So Dr. Pittman and myself have been working on this for the last maybe month and a half. Um, Dr. Pittman is here. Uh, so Dr. Pittman, please jump in whenever um, you feel so inclined. But we just got these draft policies from uh, NCSBA on July 28th. Um, so that is why you have not, uh, these the policy working group has not seen these the first no other board members have seen these except as they were presented, as I said, because we just got them. But I have gone through, if you can um, pull up the PowerPoint, Ms. Smith, please. Sure. 
Next slide, please. Uh, I uh, summed this up a little bit um, for you before, and I'll just kind of give you a brief history. I know we're short on time, but just to kind of give you a brief history is that the Obama era um, sexual harassment um, rules were um, withdrawn by the Trump administration in 2017, and they adopted um, new regulations regarding sexual um, harassment and discrimination. If you recall, we had to, all boards had to adopt those new policies. And so this is a new uh, set of regulations that um, have been adopted and they require um, a lot more work. And uh, Dr. Pittman and I, as I said, have been meeting at least once a week for probably the last month and a half, trying to make sure that we're ready and we'll be compliant. As a result of us only getting these on July 28th and then going into effect on August 14th, we are requesting a waiver of a second reading and adoption tonight um, by the board. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to go through um, all of these policies. As I said, there are multiple pages, but just to kind of give you um, an idea. Next slide, please. I've done, I've provided the summation chart for these. It's basically, they've changed some of the definitions. Um, we previously had a uniform process. Now it's been split out between all of the different discrimination policies so that Title IX kind of stands on its own. And we've had, that's what all of these multiple policies require. Next slide, please. So this is the summation. Um, as I, if you, as I said, I'm not going to read all this in the interest of time. Um, but these are the draft policies from uh, NCSBA that they've shared around the state, and that everyone basically just got um, a few days ago. Um, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, oh, the one thing that I do need guidance from the board on is 1725. If you look at the bottom of your screen for definitions, uh, the definition of fondling, the draft that um, NCSBA sent to us said the definition of fondling is over clothing, touching for sexual gratification. And my recommendation is that we change it to underneath clothing. I'm sorry. The def what they sent us said underneath clothing only. I changed it to, because that's an option and I need the board's guidance on this to over the clothes touching and fondling for sexual gratification. So we can make it underneath, which is obviously a not necessarily a lower standard, but if someone touches a child's genitals over their clothes, it wouldn't be defined as fondling under the first option. If you just say underneath. I support that change, Ms. Giovanni. Okay. Okay. If there any Ms. Board Giovanni, can can you just clarify in three sentences what Attorney General Stein's uh, lawsuit is? I mean, do you so, you have knowledge of that? And what not, claims? Not in detail. I just saw um, an email, like a paragraph email from uh, Carolyn Murchison at Therrington. I know Rod may know a little bit more, but I'm not sure. Like I know that they were talking about like that just basically the objection to it because it's like it prohibits us from uh, pursuing like sexual harassment um, claims unless certain elements are met. So it raises the bar significantly for sexual harassment. Like we can investigate, I think, off campus. I mean, it's a very there's a lot that um, they've done. So I'm not sure I haven't seen it. As I said, I've only seen that paragraph that there's these pending lawsuits. So Rod, is there are you more familiar with it or is Carolyn shared that with you? Unfortunately not. I mean, I can try to find that email and look it up here now, but I'm not, fortunately not. I don't know any more than what you just said. Okay. That's fine. It just essentially weakened protections for students and it did it on college campuses as well. I think there've been significant concerns and, and it offers more protection from, for harassers and bulliers. Um, so it's, it's very alarming and it's alarming that we have to pass these um, in order to keep operating and while we're in opposition to this. So along those lines, uh, Mr. Malone, what happens if we don't pass, if we disagree with this? I mean, what happens here? If we don't, if we don't incorporate these policy changes, because some of this is, I've, I've been reading this from previous, but what, I mean, you mean if you don't What's do them recall? tonight or if you don't do them, period? Period. Period. I would need to research that. If I mean, I, you certainly could table it tonight, but... Um, yeah. 
I'm, yeah, I'm I would, saying I would definitely need to research that to give you a better answer. If you're thinking, so I'm saying if we dis if we disagree if we disagree with these changes, which I disagree with quite a few of them, most of I think all of them, um, and we say here in Durham, we're not going to do this. We're not going to do what the Trump administration is doing. We can have protections for our students and our staff. Um, if we say no, we're not going to incorporate your policies. I would like to. I would like to understand better what that means. Yeah, I mean, I can certainly be prepared to provide guidance to the board or Ken, you know, at the next meeting on on what that would mean. Um, but I, I don't. I wouldn't feel comfortable right now just trying to answer that. But I can definitely okay. make sure you have an answer at the next meeting, if not before. Yeah, I'd be interested in knowing that as well and knowing if there's, you know, if there are an amicus brief we could file to go along with the A.G. Stein's um, lawsuit. Just so I, I think that, um, I don't know, if Dr. Pittman, have you gone, attended the trainings, is there, did they provide any guidance on what would happen? I mean, I know you're not the lawyer, but you've gone to the trainings. Certainly. The only caution that is under consideration with this proposal is to understand this is federal Title IX directive, and it is it has passed as law, and there is a directive that LEAs will adopt their policies by August 14th. That having been said, we've discussed how strongly and seriously our schools our district, the board treats sexual harassment. We, we have very strong systems and processes in place. So the, the risk we run is we're out of compliance with the directive to pass policy by the deadline. Um, and some of the training I've attended has, has alerted us that there will be a compliance checks and just need to be cognizant of that. And, and I don't disagree with that, but I, I certainly think that the difference between tomorrow and the next board meeting is not a significant enough concern in my mind that you, that if the board has concerns about it, that we shouldn't answer these questions before you make that decision. Right. And so and thank you, uh, Dr. Pittman, for, for that update. Um, but my, my concern is like, are we losing, like, do we have to shut down? Are we losing funding of some sort? Are we, you know, you know, what, what is it? What are we looking at penalty wise? I don't care about being out of compliance. If it means that we're forced to, uh, uh, it, with, with the alternative being, we have to put this in the policy. I don't really care about being out of compliance. I want to understand what that penalty is. You know, what is that? Do we lose funding for our students? Do we lose funding for our teachers and our buildings and so forth from the federal side? And if that's a no, if it is just, they're going to say, oh, Durham is not compliant, they're not compliant. Well, I'm I'm fine with not being compliant on this. So, uh, if we have to vote tonight, I'm going to be voting no to this. That's that's just me. Uh, I prefer to under. Um, that's just me, one of six. But I, I really want to understand what non-compliance means uh, to this. There's nothing that Betsy DeVos has done that's been positive for traditional public schools since she's been there. There's nothing positive that Donald Trump has done that's been positive for public schools. And so forcing the relaxing of some of these policies uh, puts our students and staff and teachers in danger. And so 
I'm not willing to support changing this policy right now and whatever that might mean. Now, again, if it's a detriment or harm to our students and teachers that comes along with that, I'll do it. But uh, right now, I don't know what that is. So I did hear Mr. Malone say something about tabling it and for further research. Would that be an option, Mr. Malone? Or you well, and, and let me let me do. I'm actually um, texting one of. There are a couple of different lawyers as I look at some emails within the firm who have been looking at this issue. So certainly, if we could table it for at least until the end of this meeting, maybe, and then, and then maybe the next meeting, but I may be able to have an answer to, to discuss with the board in closed session by the time you get into closed session. Well, I don't, I mean, you mean like when we come back and open after the closed session to talk? That's about what that? I was thinking. Yes. So, okay. That, I, I would, um, I have a lot of trepidation about not adopting it. I know that in general, I mean, and I think I'm going to defer to Rod and the experts on this as he's doing, but um, I definitely would like us to have an answer, you know, tonight if, or no later than, to, well, we can't do it tomorrow because there's not a board meeting, but we definitely need to have a decision. I don't agree with these either, obviously. It's a very upsetting, um, and I think everyone around the country, the majority of people that care about children are very upset by these, but I also don't want to jeopardize our access to federal funds, so I think we need to make sure we have, we we thought this through. Um, and so I think with Rod texting everybody, um, I would agree that we kind of table this through the end of the meeting and then wait to get final advice from Rod, if that's okay with the board. But we do need to do it in open session though, whatever you decide, so, okay? Is that- Ms. Umstead? Yeah, that's okay with me. I think I would have a question of like, sometimes you all give us policies and we can be more stringent than what it is. And so I'm wondering if that, I have no clue because I'm not um, don't know enough about the federal policies. If there's a way that we could have our own that goes beyond or redefines that we've written this and we still have our own processes that go to what we believe in um, in this process. Well, I think that, um, as I said, Dr. Pippen and I, and I, I know we're getting late, and I, but I think this warrants conversation. Dr. Pippen and I have discussed it. Um, she's our Title IX coordinator. We have honestly um, really good processes in place to protect students. And our principals have done a great job on that, working with Dr. Pittman. So I feel that as we've worked through this, we're definitely not going to lose um, that protection of children that has been part of our culture under Dr. Pittman's leadership. However, there are certain things, as I said, that this does maybe prevent us from doing, but it doesn't stop us from protecting children in our schools. I mean, that is... Um, the bottom line and make sure that we get the additional training. It's a lot, that's a lot more of it, but I do respect um, Mr. Lee's um, feelings and I'm sure the other board members, I know Mrs. Byers as well, has stated that, that these are very um, unpleasant policies and the changes are, no one likes them, as I said before, that cares about children around the country. So um, with the board's permission, I think maybe the best plan for us is to wait for um, Mr. Malone to get some further um, input from his firm, the experts that work on this in his firm and then possibly then come back to it tonight and make a final decision. Yeah, and I, I, I just I just was on the phone with one of the guys and, and what, what he what he just said um, that one of our clients did and this and he's gonna send me the language and this may be a reasonable compromise is um, that they basically adopted a policy that basically said that they would follow what the regulations say is kind of what their policy language says. And then in the meantime, they are continuing to examine this language that you have here that for the same concerns and trying to analyze what is the best next step for them. Um, so that, that keeps you in compliance in the short term. And it, but it does leave the door open for you to have the kind of conversation that it sounds like you want to have about this policy. I think everybody is struggling with it. So um, that may be the best, or I won't say the best, but that's certainly an option uh, for you that's maybe a hybrid between just tabling it and, and funding it down the road, um, gets you in compliance for now, but certainly leaves you some 
time and flexibility to think about the next best choice. And um, I hope to have that language from the other policy here shortly. But, um, you know, that's certainly something that you could consider tonight. So you're waiting for the, to get the language run? Yes, but it, yes. I, I explained to him that the board is literally meeting right now, so I need it like right now. <laughs> okay. So, Mrs. Myers, I'm ready to move on to the next policy if, while we wait for feedback from Mr. Malone's associates. Yes, that sounds perfect. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, Ms. Ms. Smith, if you could pull up the 4207 directory information. I don't know. Well, actually, I didn't send it to you. Did I? I didn't send you a PowerPoint because we just got it <laughs> this morning. Uh, board members, if you um, would take a look at, um, well, I sent you the email early this morning explaining that given the remote learning that under Plan C and various conversations that have occurred regarding recording of students and FERPA and privacy issues, um, Dr. Hardy and myself and Ms. Sidbury and Dr. Mavanga have had um, multiple meetings trying to navigate and figure this out like everyone else around the country. So I know Dr. Hardy has gotten feedback from uh, other large districts on kind of what they're doing. And basically it's been 50-50. Some districts are saying absolutely no um, recording. Other districts are saying, yes, we're gonna allow recording, but with these uh, various parameters. So after we met, um, I then met with uh, Mr. Malone and Mr. Sue to kind of discuss the best way for Durham to be able to record them if we could and still be compliant with FERPA. And while we were on that conversation, and Mr. Malone, feel free to jump in and share with our conversation that you, me, and Ken had. Um, basically, while we were on the call at 8.20 in the morning, um, Mr. Malone got an email from Mr. Ramey in Therrington that came up with an alternative uh, that would allow us to record, video record and audio record these lessons by designating them as directory information so that they could be shared with students in the class. And so in order to do that, however, it does require um, an amendment to the directory policy. So by way of history, the directory policy was tabled initially while we um, continue to work on it. Durham's directory policy is a little different than the majority of other districts. So um, considering that we moved it to the cleanup so that we could have a lot of conversation as the board more wanted around that policy. But today we're asking for what is kind of a temporary amendment to the directory policy to allow for the recording of the lessons to be designated as directory information. I mean, I think you, accurately covered everything the the key being that the child's picture and name and responses um, would otherwise be deemed a student record and this makes that directory but it's we are limiting it in the policy change to the other students who are in the class. So a student in the class would have access to the video. Um, a, the, a member of the public would not have access to the video because we're now able to have directory information be limited to in its scope. So that allows us to limit the directory information only to other students who are in the class um, and you'll see in the draft policy change, one possible additional limitation would be to say that that the student who would have access to the video would have to have missed the class or would have missed the video. But and I'm not saying that we're recommending that, but that is another limitation that one could place on it. I think that um, your instructional people would prefer that it be made available to any of the kids in the class to be reviewed subsequently as they prepare. But um, that certainly is is another option that we at least discussed. And just to, fight, to add to that, um, and Dr. Hardy and Ms. Hoodbury, please jump in. Y'all are the um, educate, instructional educational experts. But um, kind of part of the conversation surrounding this is that absent this, like a, a lot of other school systems are suggesting that teachers pre-record these lessons, which will require teachers every night you know, before the school day starts to do their whole lesson plan, 
lesson with just them being recorded and then have that to share. So um, Dr. Hardy and Ms. Sidberry explained that that would just be too onerous on our teachers and then have them to go, then go through and try to teach these lessons as well. So we felt like um, trying to balance that, that this was kind of the best balance. So I think Dr. Hardy, if you want to add your input. Ms. Giovanni, I agree with everything that you have shared and um, we appreciate the board considering this. We do wanna make sure that um, we are providing every opportunity for our students. And we know that there will be some students who are not able to participate in every synchronous learning opportunity. And this will also help support our students in their learning. So the, I've had two board members also reach out to me regarding kind of a, um, when will this stop? You know, when will this end? So we're doing it right now. If the board adopts it, let's say, uh, when would it change? And so I shared, I think, via text with Ms. Lewis that um, we're going to be bringing the directory policy to the board in, as part of cleanup in November, December. So assuming that um, we go back uh, and no longer do remote learning before then, we would then bring the policy back to the board um, for consideration. I think that we are definitely on top of this. It's, we talk about this and think about this 24 hours a day, it feels like. So um, to answer your question, I don't suggest that we kind of include any type of automatic termination clause on a board policy. I think that it definitely always warrants conversation from the board um, regarding this. And so that would be my recommendation is that if you do adopt it, that you allow it to stand until we go back and then the board would, we would bring it back and or bring back the new or proposed update to the directory information policy in any event, because that's going to, you know, uh, involve a lot more conversation because the um, proposed draft policy on the director information is uh, kind of tracks FERPA. So we would need input from the board in detail in any event on the final directory policy. Ms. Giovanni, you do need action on this item tonight. Um, yes, and this would be another where um, would be requesting a waiver of uh, the second read because school is going to start on Monday and we want teachers. I know that there may be that may not need to be happening. I don't know with the orientation meetings, et cetera, but I do think we probably should do it so that they can practice even with that. You know, if we don't have this, it's going to be hard for teachers to kind of do that orientation where they're practicing recording and interacting with students um, on the video. So it would be, I think, Dr. Hardy, if, um, I think you're in support, Dr. Mabanga, I think we have their, their support to request that the board waive um, the second reading. And I apologize again for the lateness. Um, we just got it this morning, I know, but Therrington's been you know, working hard for a lot of districts around the state on this and God bless them for it. And I'll just share what Ken shared with me that um, he had been in the Johnston meeting and they were having the same conversation and but they didn't have this because Neil hadn't come up with it yet. So um, this, uh, he just came up with it uh, yesterday and we were able to get this policy from Therrington. So we really appreciate how hard they worked and how fast they worked on this. So yes, Mrs. Byer, all that to say, we would request <laughs> adoption and waiver of this. Second. I appreciate it, Ms. I, Ms. Unstead. Yeah, I just wanna say thank you to the team for all the work on this. I think. When we think about synchronous learning and parents balancing work and all the and other responsibilities, the ability to be able to record a video and share it later and students to rewatch it, I think is super important um, as we hear more and more stories of parents figuring out how they're juggling those. So I would move that we approve this policy um, with and waive the second reading, I think 4207, um, so that we- Oh, a second. Sorry. That's all right. I thought you were, I thought you were done with Umstead. I don't need to. Mm. <laughs> it's been moved by Ms. Umstead and seconded by Mr. Lee. Any further discussion? My, my only discussion is the, the memory that we really, really dug into this policy quite a bit to protect our undocumented students during a lot of the ICE raids. And we want to make sure that whatever we do going forward, we're teaching our folks, you know, not to take pictures of Zoom screens and not to share things out that would identify um, students and, and put them at risk in any way. And I'm sure that's how we're training folks already. But um, I appreciate that. Um, I think we're ready for a vote. Ms. Lewis, happy birthday. Hi. I'm Ms. Umstead. Hi. Mr. Lee. Hi. Mr. Sears. Aye. Ms. Valladares. 
Aye. And I vote aye as well. Thank you. It is unanimous. That, Ms. Giovanni, does this bring us to the end of your um, long, long, long uh, item? Yes, Mrs. Meyer, subject to, um, I think, waiting for Mr. Malone to give us some more feedback on that Title IX. But yes, ma'am. I'm you. telling you, just I just sent you an email a couple minutes ago. If you'll check that, and then, you know, maybe try to get up with me, and then we can maybe get this back. Okay, perfect. But yes, Ms. My Mrs. Byer, I'll work with Rod on the backside in the background, and we can move forward. Thank you. I'm going to um, take a point of privilege and see if I get any nods to this idea to take a five-minute recess at this moment in time in this meeting. Anyone? Anyone? Y'all are all so, good to keep going. Over there. That if I could bring if my I could, computer. If I could interrupt for just a moment, all of your phones will start ringing at eight ten with the robocall about orientation week. Perfect. I'm, I'm bringing the computer though, because it's my section. I'm gonna have to answer questions. Okay. So okay. we're gonna go ahead and take that recess. Uh -huh. I would like a, a, like five, see, meet y'all back here in five, if that's all right. That sounds good. All right, eight ten. We'll be right back here. Thanks.
I can ask board members that are on to just flash your camera so we can know whether folks are back and we have a quorum or not. I see Ms. Lewis, Ms. Umstead, Mr. Sears. I don't see the recording button, so I'm going to say it flash my camera. <laughs> and there's Mr. Lee, da da. And I see Ms. Valladara's name. I'm not sure she's back yet. I'm back. Perfect. Everybody ready to roll? All right. Let's do it. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate that. I got a new glass of water, so I'm good to go. Um, so that brings us to operational services. Board policy 7503 remote work. Hey, good evening, everyone. I um, have, I regret to inform you, I have one more policy for you, but it should be quick, hopefully. Um, this is a brand new policy. Um, we really wanted to provide flexibility for our employees and some guidance for them, as well as guidance for supervisors. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the language came from the school boards association policy with very few changes, but because it's a brand new policy, I didn't do you know, the slides that we usually do extrapolating you know, old and new information. Um, so yeah, so we would, I would request if at all possible to, if you don't find major issues with the policy to, to waive a second reading because of our all virtual remote learning. Um, I would like to address one comment that was made at the public comment about remote, remote work. And um, in the policy, it does say that employees should have their equipment and internet access. Our buildings will be open for staff members who don't have internet access at home. And so they can, they're more than welcome to teach from their classroom since the buildings will be largely empty. Um, it is a safe space where they can access internet and all of their DPS property. And I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have. Brand new policy for a brand new day. Board members, you've seen this policy, it's in your packet. Anyone have questions on it? Clarification needed on any of the points? I do have a go ahead sorry i do have a question about eligible employees um can you tell me more about that definition it's in two like sure. how, are we, how are we defining what it means to be eligible sure it's basically those employees that are able to perform their jobs like teachers a little bit further down, it talks a little, I, I don't know why it's ordered this way and we can certainly change it, but it is in, let's see, there's another section that speaks to uh, employees who may not be able to, um, to work from home due to the nature of their job. I'm sorry, I'm trying to find it. I wonder if it would be helpful to, if Miss Smith, you could, um, project the policy onto the screen, if at all possible. Let's see. On page 296, if that's helpful of the packet, I think, or 290. <clears throat> So I, I mean, I guess I could speak to the L, that was again in the uh, included in the base language that from school board association, but it, it may refer to employees, for example, bus drivers who are not able to obviously perform their jobs remotely um, to do commensurate work, whereas teachers, instructional specialists, instructional assistants, and others are able to complete the bulk of their work responsibilities um, remotely. And I think my question kind of comes in where we have that definition and then the bottom of section B where it says employee supervisor determined that employee is unable to perform his or her essential job duties while working remotely. The employee may be required, required to take any available accrued leave. Um, and I think as we're in the midst of this pandemic and we've been trying to understand like how are we flexible with as staff members and making sure we're assigning 
you know, if you are a bus driver, what other remote work maybe could you do so that you're not having to take that leave time? And especially for staff members who, um, who have an accrued leave, who might be new to our district. So I'm wondering, is there a way that we can write that type of flexibility into the policy? Sure, we could, we could definitely um, take a look at some language or draft some language in there. One of the other provisions that is available just, and this is pretty COVID specific, but the, the use of federal emergency sick leave is also available for employees that, based on the COVID crisis that are caring for someone or they're diagnosed with COVID themselves, or if they're, um, you know, they're caring for someone or they have a lack of childcare. I, know, I recognize that's, that's different, um, but it does provide some provision so that employees don't have to use their own leave for, for those specific cases. And the other thing is we definitely are um, kind of, I guess what's the, like sending out a survey or polling our employees to be to ascertain whether or not they're able to take on additional assignments, such as you'll, you'll hear Dr. Hardy talking about the child care sites. And so that's definitely something that we're going to be making available to our employees as well. Uh, other board members have questions or comments? I feel like we're in such unprecedented times that, you know, you may have to have a draft policy to see what changes might need to be made once we get feedback. Um, um, Ms. Molly Dyrus, yes. Yeah, so I'm going to piggyback on um, the eligible employee because I guess for me, it's, um, it raises the question of like, who is a non-eligible employee? And I, and I hear, you know, that, you know, bus drivers and that there's going to be flexibility of placing them, but I feel like that that wording by saying eligible that it almost infers they're non-eligible employees as well, um, and I think that that should be addressed somewhere in the paragraph, like um, if we're going to use that terminology. So the addition of maybe examples of specific roles or changing that altogether. Yeah, because I think that eligibility is is um, like we we are we are in, in essence saying that there there are employees that are eligible and and inferring that there are employees that are not eligible and because we in the in COVID times I mean we have to think about like learning centers I mean there's there's ways that even things can evolve that might open up for even employees that may not be the ones that we're thinking of that they might have to there might be some flexibility right. Um, uh, so I'm just I'm just wondering if there's, yeah, in, in terms of like not just a role but also like employees, uh, the eligibility. Like if we, if we take away eligible employee instead of like making it an, uh, a description for the employee, like we just say the eligibility, like employees can be eligible. It just takes away from eligible employees versus non-eligible employees. You know, it, I see what you mean. Sure. I do want to make a distinction though that that our employees, while we are trying to provide opportunities that they can work at maybe in alternative settings or doing alternative things. This is specific to remote work. So I'm just, I will definitely think about a way to wordsmith that, that um, to put like employees who are eligible are able to perform their job duties or something like that. I can certainly um, wordsmith like that. But, um, you know, there definitely are going to be groups of employees that are not able to work remotely. So I do want to make that clear just in the example that I provided it would be difficult for a bus driver. There's no, you know, doing the bulk of their job. Now there definitely will be alternative assignments available, but that's completely different than this policy. Well, and to me, Ms. Atkins, it, it's not the employee that's eligible or not eligible. It's whether the remote work can be done remotely that you're trying to define. I mean, it, it, some tasks, uh, some jobs really are, are not remote. <laughs> and so, um, Sure. see that in, in essential employees kind of all through our society. Um. Um, I had a question. Um, being as this is a new policy, I know you're talking about uh, maybe waiving the second reading, but also just for transparency that being introduced in the, in the, um, to the public at this point as well. What would be the hesitation to doing a second reading does this policy have to be in place by the time school begins or? I don't think it does. We've been, you know, we've had 
limited instances of, of remote work. So I don't, I don't think it does. We don't have to, especially since there's been feedback and some specific verbiage to be included. We can certainly take it back for a second reading. Thank you for that. Other thoughts and other feedback that folks have? I know Ms. Atkins would welcome that tonight or in the future. Yeah, and if we're going to move to a second read, I would definitely um, email any other thoughts as you're working on any words, nothing, and help wherever I can. Thank you. Sure. That sounds good. Thank you for bringing this, Rossi. And you and you do have flexibility so that if we, you want us to pass it on first reading and bring it to our um, full board meeting, is that what the time frame that you think would work best? That would With be modifications? great. Modifications. Okay. All right, I move we send this policy to uh, the full board meeting, I mean, the meeting on the 27th for second reading for action. I second it. Been moved by Mr. Lee and seconded by Ms. Umstead that we bring policy 7503 remote work first reading to our full board meeting for second reading. Any further discussion? If um, not, I have one, yeah. one, one point. So um, for those roles where employees, you know, are eligible to work remotely, but um, we, ha we also have to think about the fact that we have um, employees that don't have the setup at home, right? And, and so they're going to have to, I know that the buildings are open for staff to come in and use computers and all that, but we, we are also having to think about families and, you know, staff that have children that, you know, can't come into the buildings, right? Um, and so what are, what are the considerations with um, remote work for staff that do have complications um, um, or, you know, that that, you know, that, that have different, the, the families that we have in our district, like we have, we have staff that have children and and so um if they don't have the connectivity if they don't have the internet if they don't have the the laptop you know not 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 uh, uh, instructional assistance um not all of them are they don't they don't have like not everybody's getting a laptop right so um that's something else to think about and i just wonder if there's anything in terms of like setups um for this remote work Right now, as I said, our, especially because we are in this dire situation with hotspots and we're really trying to get the, our, all of our devices and hotspots into the hands of the students who need it most, right now our sort of workaround for employees with no connectivity or internet is to come to the location because there won't be students there is to come to school. Well, I do, we do understand that there are also limitations to that for the reasons you stated. So we'll continue to think about it and work on it, especially as we go into this new territory, some of it is going to have to be trial and error and seeing, and we will certainly always, as we always do, work with our employees who truly um, need the support, and we, um, you know, we will certainly be flexible with employees who just, it's not feasible either way. Thank you. Sorry, any further discussion? If not, I think we're at the vote. Ms. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Umstead? Aye. Mr. Lee? Aye. Mr. Sears? Aye. Ms. Valley Dyers? Aye. And I vote aye as well. It passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Adkins, for this policy. That brings us to academic and student support services. Hooray! Our final pre-K sliding scale waiver is the first item I have. Who's leading us in that discussion? Good evening, board members. Tonight we are going to discuss a couple of items regarding, we have one for the waiver of pre-K and then our DPS learning centers. Ms. Smith, if you could bring up the first presentation, please. Thank you very much. This evening, administration is bringing to the board for consideration 
a recommendation to waive the pre-K sliding fee scale during Plan C, which is our district-wide remote learning. This recommendation will hold families harmless while instruction is remote. As a district, we know that many of our families across Durham are facing intense challenges during this, during this pandemic. This will provide some relief for families as they navigate the complexities of COVID-19. This recommendation aligns with strategic plan priority one to increase academic achievement and priority five, ensuring fiscal and operational responsibility. At this time, I would like to recognize Dr. Debbie Pittman, Assistant Superintendent for Specialized Services, and Ms. Suzanne Cotterman, Director for the Office of Early Education. They will provide specific information for your discussion and address any questions as we move to the close throughout the presentation. I'll turn it over now to Dr. Pittman. Thank you, Dr. Hardy. Next slide, please. Good evening, members of the board and Superintendent Mubenga. This evening, Ms. Cotterman and I are pleased to provide a brief highlight of the proposed recommendation. Ms. Smith, I'm ready for the next slide, if possible. Thank you. The rationale behind the recommendation, a review of the pre-K sliding scale and uh, the, the implications that will come with the waiver of the sliding scale fee. And of course, we'll take some time for any questions and discussion. Next slide. So the proposed recommendation is to waive the pre-K sliding scale fee during remote learning. If approved, there will be no tuition fees collected while the district is implementing Plan C. But the fee waiver for parents will be temporary. Families will be notified of the pre-K sliding scale upon enrollment, and that is based on income verification this will ensure that once remote learning ends, that families are aware that there is a sliding scale fee. When schools reopen for face-to-face -face instruction, the district will reinstate the pre-K fees according to the board approved scale. Next slide. So the rationale behind this recommendation was to ease the impact of plan C remote learning on pre-K families in particular. Under Plan C for remote learning, our families with preschool age children will now need to incur the cost for the sliding scale fee in addition to making accommodations for unexpected additional childcare costs with their preschooler at home. We have received concerns from many of our pre-K families about the cost of pre-K tuition while students are served remotely. We recognize that families must pay tuition and pay for child care costs, there is a concern that families will not be able to afford both and subsequently will not be able to afford Durham pre-K. We value and embrace our new pre-K families as part of our school community. We want to be responsive to their needs to ease the financial burden on our families if we are able. On the next two slides, Suzanne Cotterman, our Director of the Office of Early Ed Education, We'll review the pre-K sliding scale with the board that you approved last February. And then she will outline some of the, possi the possible fiscal impacts on the district. Ms. Cotterman, next slide. Thank you, Dr. Pittman, now that I've unmuted myself. <laughs> I apologize for that. And good evening, everyone. On the table before you, you can see that the pre-K sliding scale fee factors in family size and family household income. If you follow across with me, for a four-member family, the scale provides for no parent fees up to 400% of the federal poverty level, which is $102,999 of income. Keep in mind that these charges reflect only a three-quarter day, so six and a half hour program, and they're only for 10 months. Most working families need wrap care in addition to preschool services for 12 months. If the sliding scale is not waived during the remote plan C, families will need to cover the cost of the pre-K tuition and child care. If the board approves the pre-K tuition waiver, there will be some fiscal impacts on the district. Next slide, please. There will be a reduction in Durham Public Schools pre-K revenue. 
it's hard to calculate the exact figures because the variable changes each year and we're implementing a new fee scale. However, just to give the board a rough estimate of the impact of this decision, based on previous year's tuition averages, we calculated a possible quarterly loss of approximately $56,207. It should be noted that previously, these funds have been used to support the specialized Montessori programs and the WIDU program, which is, and it's also used to offset the costs of personnel and to meet other needs such as professional development. The good news is that NC Pre-K has made the decision for the 2020-2021 school year to provide payments to North Carolina Pre-K contracting agencies based on the number of contracted slots. Durham Pre-K has also announced that it will support Durham Pre-K slots at the Witted School. The federal Title I, EC Pre-K, and state EC Pre-K funds are also holding steady. Back to you, Dr. Hardy. Sometimes finding that unmute button is harder than we think. <laughs> yes. Go to the next slide, please. Tonight, board members, we are recommending, the administration recommends that we, that the board waive the pre-K sliding scale fee while we are in remote loan, learning only. This action is needed to, um, because the board would need to approve the pre-K sliding scale, which you did in February of 2020. Since this pre-K recommendation will result in revenue reduction, this proposal requires board approval, action, and notification. At this time, of course, we are open to any questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much to the whole team. Ms. Lewis. Ms. Connerman, can you explain the last two points that you made on that last slide, the North K pre-K to make, I didn't understand, I didn't follow that, I'm sorry. Sure, no problem. So NC pre-K, we are a contractor, and so they reimburse us for some of our slots and, and place some students that meet their criteria with us. Um, normally, we would be reimbursed $320 per child based on attendance. Because of the COVID situation, um, we were very worried about that because we certainly didn't want children, and, and this is across the nation, um, we certainly didn't want children to feel like they weren't getting what they needed. So. Um, they have decided that they will reimburse us on the number of slots, so we will get full reimbursement, even if it's, you know, impossible for a family to join us on a particular day. And the same thing with Durham Pre-K. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> no problem. Other questions or discussion on this item? I just wanted to, um, just for those um, listening, I've heard from a lot of different people. The reason for this is because a lot of people will have to pay for external child, uh, uh, child care, All right? If we if we were to hold it the same, it would be external child care and their pre-K slot, right? And so what we're trying to do is, you know, since we're not, since we're not in the building for pre-K, we're taking away our charge and allowing them to use that money for their private or out of school pre-K. Is that correct? Is that it? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So I look forward to a kind of continuing conversation as well, and it might come in the learning center update or it might come in, in future meetings, but what is our district thinking on our commitment to pre-K and when we might prioritize or triage those students to be able to come back in person? Um, I think it's really, really important. I, you know, I've seen a lot of chatter um, and we had some public comment tonight about, you know, needing to get Chromebooks to four-year-olds and three-year-olds. And, and I think that is because, you know, our community acknowledges the, the profound importance of early learning. Um, but it's to me so much with these small, smallest young learners, it has to be in person as soon as we can safely do that. And so I look forward to continuing conversations um, about how we can do that and how we do prioritize that as a community. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Sunset. 
Yeah, um, thank y'all for bringing this to us. I know that we won't be doing in-person instruction, but I am under the oh. understanding that we are still providing some materials and content for families. Can you share a little bit about what we will be doing for families? Absolutely, I will definitely let Ms. Cotterman speak to those specifics, but I do, as Mr. Lee mentioned, um, we do wanna make sure that our pre-K families we know that the board values pre-K. You have um, supported and adopted our pre-K addendum strategies earlier this year. So that is part of the work that we're doing with our strategic plan, making sure that given the cognitive needs of our earliest learners, our four-year-olds, that there is going to be a balance between activities that they will be able to complete in their home with paper to pencil, as well as activities that they'll be able to complete virtually. And I'll let Ms. Carterman speak to some of those specifics. Thank you, Dr. Hardy. So yes, we have a very robust plan for our preschool teachers and um, we have provided sample schedule for them. And that has also been shared with principals and teachers will be sharing that with parents as well. Um, teachers will have time to work with students in a large group. So they'll do a morning circle time. They'll have some small groups. They'll also do have a math and a literacy time. And of course those will be um, short within the developmental um, guidelines. And they'll also have time in the afternoon to work one-on-one -on -one with parents and um, you know, via phone or Zoom or however it's comfortable for the parents to work. Um, for our students that don't have access to technology, we do have um, some really great packets that mirror the daily work that our teachers will be doing. They have cognitive activities, social emotional learning, physical learning, language needs. And there are also activities that are designed so that their caregiver or parent and support their child. And then teachers will be providing daily connections with the child and the parent via phone to help with um, any questions or you know, any information that the parent may need. I think one other point to add is that given the class size and that in each of our pre-K classrooms, we have our pre-K teacher um, and at a minimum an instructional assistant, many of our classrooms um, may have two instructional assistants. Our class ratio is not to exceed 12 students. So many in many of our classrooms, if you divide that up in our classrooms, one to 10, our teachers are going to be able to provide those daily connections to five students. And so it's a little bit of difference when we think about um, the class size of um, our, many of our traditional classrooms, especially in upper grades. So making sure that they have that personal connection and that we can support the learning um, for our earliest learners. If I may, I just, Ms. Cotterman, would you mind calling attention to the resources that are available for families, the virtual field trips, the weekly? Oh, sure. Just so, briefly. Uh, no problem. On our website, um, there are some COVID resources that, um, there's a page for COVID resources, and there is a resource there for our parents. Um, it does have a page that has all kinds of virtual resources. There's virtual field trips, there's math and literacy activities. There's also 10 weeks of virtual lesson plans that parents can do, including um, literacy, math, writing. And those are all um, developed so that parents don't need any specialized anything to do it. They're using um, household items and things that you would have around your house. Um, as well as there's a link to our Waterford software for our students, which is a software that also provides literacy and math um, skills and infuses some science and social studies. So there is that link um, that parents can access right through our website. Excellent. I was going to just uh, say, yeah, it sounds like um, education will be going forward with our um, pre-K students. That's, those are some great options and resources for families to tap into. As you're all talking about the packets for those who don't have um, access, uh, technology access and having packets, will their teachers still be making contact with them via phone or other means to provide support and services? I'm seeing nods. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Okay. Time so, built in their schedules to do just that. Okay. Good. Good. And then um, going back to the fee part, um, and you said that it'll be a $56,000 loss based on what has been brought in um, previously. I'm curious to know, what did that funding originally go to? So that funding, I'm sorry, Dr. Pittman, would you rather? You may. No, please. That funding originally um, helps, well, it does help support pay for the preschool teachers as well as the instructional assistants. So there's personnel implications and it also funds um, some professional development 
And um, our pre-K strategic plan addendum is really our, um, our addendum um, goals are really around professional development. So that would help support that as well. And were you saying that the um, NC pre-K making the payments, the $320 per child, that would now supplement where that loss is? Well, it won't supplement it because that money does go for personnel and salaries pr predominantly, but it will allow us to continue paying our teachers and, and keeping our program robust. So we won't lose any classrooms or teachers or, you know, have to cut our program because of that. Okay. And this is an action item for tonight, and I'm sorry that we kind of took you all off a pre-K uh, field trip there, but I really appreciate it. I think it's important for us to have that conversation and the importance of early learning. Other uh, questions, discussions, or I would welcome a um, motion just, on this item. I have something, just a point of clarification. So sure. um, just to summarize, so we are waiving the fees for pre-K. Um, we have traditionally had... Um, Pre-K students that um, have, you know, um, have not had fees, right? And, and so these would be exceptional children, um, free and reduced lunch, I would imagine. So do we have the numbers of, I know we have the big number of like a $56,000 loss um, from what's generated, but do we have like in terms of like what percentage of our kids, uh, you know, are uh, Title I NAC versus the ones that would, would have been contributing to the $56,000. I, I, I just want to make a clarification point. Um, we don't charge our EC students any tuition at all um, because by the virtual of their disability, um, we have to provide them a free and appropriate education. So they are never charged. Um, any student that would qualify for free and reduced lunch would not pay any tuition at all because they would qualify under that federal poverty level. Um, so it would be anyone who made above $102,999 that would be getting their tuition waived. For the students that didn't pay any tuition, they, it would not make any difference in their um, fees. They would not pay any fees. It would be free. And, and no student with our recommendation is losing their seat. So Correct. all of the pre-K students that have either received their street be seat because of um, their um, either their fee base, you know, non fee based seat or EC pre-K, this recommendation simply is waiving that tuition cost. We will still be working with all of our pre-K families, making those personal connections each day, providing them with the tools and resources. Correct. Thank you. No problem. If there's no further discussion, we do need a motion to um, make take this action tonight. I would move to waive the pre-K sliding fee scale um, for as long as we are doing remote learning. I'll second. <clears throat> and moved by Ms. Umstead and seconded by Mr. Lee. Any further discussion? Ms. Uh, Ms. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Umstead. Aye. Mr. Lee. Aye. Mr. Sears. Aye. Ms. Valladares. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Thank you all staff for bringing this important issue to us this evening as you manage. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hardy, you have another item. I do. A big one. Um, yes, excited to talk about our DPS learning centers. Ms. Smith, if you can bring up the presentation, please. This evening, board members, again, another item before you for action is um, to discuss a collaborative effort that we have had with Student U, led by Ms. Alexander Zagbayu as a convening partner, as well as Megan Gonzalez, Executive Director of the DPS Foundation, as well as several DPS staff members who have been leading this initiative. 
these centers will definitely be a joint effort and collaborative effort between DPS staff and our community, representing multiple departments within Durham Public Schools. I would like to acknowledge the staff members that have been working on this project. Dr. Dietrich Danner, Executive Director for Professional Learning, Community Education and Federal Programs. Dr. Laverne Maddox Perry, Senior Executive Director, Student Support Services. Dr. Debbie Pittman, Assistant Superintendent, Specialized Services. And Ms. Melissa Watson, Director of the Office of School Relations. Next slide, please. Tonight, we will provide and share the rationale for our learning centers. We'll discuss our adherence to health and safety guidelines, programming, our learning centers, including a summary of our staffing and resources in anticipated cost. Next slide, please. This is truly a collaborative opportunity from Durham Public Schools and our community partners as we offer a solution to support families as they return to the workplace. These centers are necessary for the overall wellness of our students and will provide a safe, socially distant, um, cohort structured, well supported environment for our children. The learning centers will be staffed by childcare professionals, trained educational staff, as well as volunteers to support our children as they engage in their work with remote learning. While engaging in remote online learning, our students will benefit from having a small group and, um, and working with their peers to support them in terms of the social and emotional needs. These centers will also help us offset some additional potential trauma that could be caused and may have been caused and evolved from the lack of both in-person instruction and peer interaction during this pandemic. Next slide, please. Our DPS learning centers will be housed at three elementary schools and three middle schools and will service children pre-K to 12. Those sites are Eno Valley Elementary, Southwest Elementary, W.G. Pearson Elementary, Giffins Middle School, Carrington Middle School, and Shepherd Middle School. Program will begin for K-5 students on August 21st, excuse me, August 24th and for 612 students on August 31st. The program will remain in place throughout the duration of Plan C. Participants will receive support for remote learning. They will receive breakfast, lunch, and an afternoon snack. The total capacity will be 900 students with a ratio of one to 10 and 150 slots per school. Our, communication, our community education staff and other identified staff and volunteers will support our programming. Next slide, please. We are collaborating with many community partners to leverage some of our existing partnerships to creative, creatively coordinate push-in services for our DPS learning centers. Some of those partners and connections include alliance with our co-located mental health, our counselors and student service staff to provide age-appropriate guidance, Durham County Social Services will continue to provide additional wraparound services for families impacted from remote learning, as well as our student support services staff to provide social and emotional needs to our children during this pivotal, pivotal time in their lives. If you can go forward two slides, please. Thank you so much. Now I will share with you some of the projected expenses or anticipated expenses for our learning centers. These expenditures for salaries are in the amount of $462,388, which is comprised of community education staff who will provide oversight to each of the learning centers. 104 community education staff members have confirmed via survey that they are willing to provide in-person services for our remote learning centers, excuse me, our learning centers. There is an additional need of 124 staff members to adequately support our programming. We will be working with our instructional, instructional assistants and other staff as well as volunteers um, to make sure that we are providing support for our learning centers as we move forward with this endeavor. Estimated cost for supplies and materials is going to be $24,500, bringing our total expenses to $486,888. Next slide, please.
So I would like to share with you our sliding fee scale. Um, we will have, as you look through some of our scenarios, what you will see is that there are some um, slots for our children that are completely free for our most vulnerable students. There is also a rate will be, that will be for our families that qualify for free or reduced price meals. There will be a rate for DPS employees, and then there will be a regular weekly rate. And then there will be a registration fee for all families that are in these three categories. Families that are free will not pay the registration fee. Next slide, please. I would like to share with you some scenarios regarding the projected revenue. So what you will see in this particular scenario is 900 students all providing in slots that are part of our paid rate. So what you will see is 900 students for our registration fee, 250 students in the free and reduced price fee, 100 students for the DPS rate, and 500 students at the full price fee. The projected revenue would be $766,000. The program expenses that we just talked about, I will reduce that out. And in this particular scenario, we would have a projected revenue after expenses of about $280,000. Next slide, please. Scenario two, again, still 900 enrolled students. However, in this particular model, there are 150 of our most vulnerable students who would have the free rate. So notice that we are only collecting the registration fee for 750 students, 450 at the full rate, 100 students, for um, the DPS rate, 200 students at the free or reduced price rate. That will yield $638,750. When I subtract out the program expenses and the registration fees, um, the, um, there is no um, projected revenue. We would actually be um, in the red, $73,112. Next slide, please. Finally, you will see another scenario. This is scenario three. Again, based on 900 students, this is this scenario provides 450 slots will be for our families that are most vulnerable and that would um, have a free rate. We are not collecting the registration fee for those students. 200 students at the full rate, 50 students at the DPS rate, 200 students at the free or reduced price rate, yielding $346,000. And as you can see, the projected revenue would yield a deficit of 100, a little over $140,000. This is before you this evening for action to make sure that we have guidance to continue to move forward in planning and working towards operationalizing our learning centers. I would also like to acknowledge our chief of staff, Ms. Tanya Giovanni Esquire, who has also worked to support the team along with Farrington Smith as we make sure that we have everything in place to support Durham Public Schools as we move forward with this effort. At this time, the team is here as well as myself, happy to address any questions that the board may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hardy, and, and to the team that's worked so, so hard on this. Um, Board members, I know you have thoughts and questions. I can just see it. Uh, Ms. Valladares. Yes, um, I, I do see the different scenarios and the breakdowns in terms of revenue um, and, you know, consideration for students that would not be charged, you know, who would, would not, I guess, the different scenarios, you know, everybody paying registration fees, scenario two, um, where some students won't pay registration fees and, and who would be um, but I'm also wondering if part of this presentation will also feature uh, who is going to be prioritizing these slots. Um, I know that there are many parents who have children with special needs um, who have, you know, been reaching out and saying, you know, that they need to have um, that level of care, that level of um, um, support during these times and remote learning for children that are on the spectrum or who have different um, uh, different um who are, who are somewhere along the spectrum, they're, they're kids who need more support than others. And so I'm wondering if um, there's gonna be also a part where we're kind of showing like who would be prioritized in terms of these slots, because 
we're talking about across class, right? For free and reduced lunch, but then there's also like um, ability and, and and needs of su support. So I just wonder if there's anything that you can share um, regarding that, regarding priorities. Thank you for that question. And so we have worked um, really collaboratively with our community partners as well as with community ed and to make sure that we have an application that um, honors the philosophy of our board when you look at those core values um, that we have in our strategic plan. And so we'll be prioritizing students, one around um, our families that are experiencing transition, homelessness, families that might be identified from um, and would be participating in our McKinney-Vento program. We'll also be um, prioritizing our students and families that qualify for free or reduced price meals. On the application, there are going to be specific questions which allow families to identify if their children um, in previous, because we know we, we might potentially have some new enrollees, have um, if students have an um, individualized education plan or an IEP, have been supported with 504 services, as well as their language acquisition needs. So our newcomer families that may be just learning uh, the English language. And so that will allow us to identify families so that we can prioritize appropriately. We've worked very collaboratively under the leadership of Dr. Danner and the community, community and staff to make sure that those questions are explicit in our application. The application will also be translated in Spanish. And if we do receive approval tonight, we'll be able to push that out on Monday um, to our families. And I have a follow-up question. Um, so we're talking about volunteers. We're talking about reaching out to community partners, partnerships with um, uh, Durham County Health Department. Um, I am also um, wondering at what point we will have, you know, folks that can work with 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 the people with the students that we are um, looking to serve. Like, you know, whether it's um, we're addressing trauma, we could be addressing um, disabilities or or um, children that are uh, differently able. Um, uh, and so, or, or we need more supports. And so I'm wondering, like, in terms of like our partnerships and how we are, we can compel any staff member or any personnel to um, show up and, and be in the building in person. Like, you know, none of our teachers um, are, are being compelled to do that. And, and I did see that some did volunteer that, that, that this would be, this is something they're consenting to, to do um, or, or that they're um, signing up to do. But in terms of like ensuring that we are going to meet the needs of, of the students that are, we're going to be serving, I'm wondering a little bit more about those partnerships. Um, if Durham County, um, the health department, like, do they have um, the the people who, who can actually have the expertise to be able to serve our, our, our children? And what what does that look like in terms of um, vetting who can serve our kids in this in this capacity? I, I definitely appreciate the question, and I think one of the things as we have been working collaboratively um, with our conveners, Ms. Agbayu and Ms. Gonzalez, is um, they have, through the HOPE Network, they have collected lots of community partners throughout um, the county and the city that are willing to provide support. We will first start, um, as I mentioned, to begin with already partners that we have. So we have co-located mental health. We have our student support staff. Um, so we do have several um, adults that are already trained that we will lean on first. Um, and then given the interest that we have, making sure that we have the opportunity to expand in those areas to provide support. Um, I also think it's important to note that um, these learning centers are to provide those safe spaces for our children. Our children will be um, working and have the connection, although virtually, with their teacher and their classroom community as well. And with many of the orientation activities, connection activities, relationship building activities, for most, for much of the time that they are in our learning centers, they will be engaging and interacting um, with their particular classroom. And then during the asynchronous time, making sure that we can provide that support. Um, and we also will be able to provide support um, for meals as well. Thank you. You're welcome. So Hardy, I guess I have deep appreciation for your team putting this together because it's it's our board that asked you to to do this because we really challenged you to to come together and and um, help us find safe spaces for children to learn because we know there's so much need. I'm I'm guess I'm concerned that there's going to be a lot of unmet needs still. Like this is just the very very tip of the iceberg, and I'm wondering what. Um, if you guys see this as a start or if you see it as a 
as the end of what we might do as a district. Um, and then I'm also very, very confused about these re revenue scenarios. Are you bringing those as to, to see what different things, different students might apply? Are you asking us to choose one and lean one way or the other as to how much we're gonna subsidize it? I'm, I guess I'm not clear what, what those are telling us. Thank you, Ms. Byer. Um, I think I'll um, start with the first question in terms of um, do we see this as the end? I think this is um, the beginning as we go into Plan C. I know there are also going to be lots of opportunities across the community as our conveners are working as well. Um, Ms. Giovanni is working very closely um, with us as well as some of our community partners in terms of additional partnerships. Um, that will be able to host learning centers. So we see this as um, a beginning. We know how important it, it is from what we heard from the board to have these up running um, as close to the beginning of school as possible. And so um, we wanted to make sure that we could provide options for our youngest learners. So pre-K to five will open um, the second week of school, August 24th, and then 612 will open the following week on August 31st. The scenarios um, were just to provide you with some sense of um, options in terms of what could be so that you were aware that um, of the cost that we will incur as a district to provide these spaces. We will, as we are getting requests in, we um, are going to prioritize slots, as we have mentioned, to ensure that we are serving our most vulnerable. Um, your action tonight is giving us action to continue with the program and to launch the um, launch the application um, in support of our recommendation regarding prioritization. We just wanted to make sure that you had some sense of what it would look like because we are anticipating if we move forward that you would also like for us to have an update later and we would we would want you to know what that update would look like in reference to um, potential revenue or potential loss of funds. So we just wanted to be as transparent and honest as possible as we get guidance from you to move forward with this initiative. No, I appreciate it. And I appreciate if you, if I missed it, can you tell me again, are we keeping kids in small pods in each classroom? We're keeping them with the same adults. What are the ratios like that like? And how are we ensuring, what metrics are we using to make sure our staff are safe every day? And, and what metrics will we use if we have to close down? I mean, I think those things are really, really critical as we're, I think, a little bit ahead of where most of us feel comfortable with 150 children in the school building. Absolutely. I will do my best to um, um, answer all those questions. And I may have to also defer to my colleague, Dr. Monk. Um, we are going to use most of the recommendations that we brought forward as we were planning in Plan B. So the ratios that Mr. Palmer and other staff had provided for us in terms of the capacity within a particular classroom. Students will be in um, pods um, or clusters of um, no more than 10 students with one adult. Students will be in a particular area of the school identified and worked in collaboration with um, our school planning department, Mr. Palmer, we will make sure that the, um, the guidelines in terms of how we screen students to enter are followed. We are also working very carefully to make sure that staff that are working our front office and other staff are um, protected using the appropriate PPE. Students will not be traveling um, to a cafeteria or to a gym. So in the event that we do have um, a youngster or an adult um, that does test positive, then we will work closely to identify those that are impacted so that we can make those very thoughtful decisions. Um, our, our new lead nurse, um, Nurse Tricia Howard, is working very closely um, with Mr. Vidalia and Ms. Super Edwards, who are our coordinators for Community Ed and will be running this program under the leadership of Dr. Danner. And so um, there's, there's no 100% um, safe guidelines, but we are following all of the recommendations to do our absolute best to provide an environment um, for our students and an environment for our staff that is the safe learning space um, that we want our children to have during Plan C. And I will yield to, I think Dr. Monk is on the other screen, if there's anything that I missed that I should have noted. Dr. Monk. No, that all sounds really good. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Mon. Other board members, Ms. Ms. Lewis, and then Ms. Armstrong. Uh, uh, before I get my, to my question, um, as far as the safety standards and minimizing risk, um, with student pickups, and I'm a parent with three children in DPS and had to pick up devices, and I saw um, those protocols taking place as far as cleaning in between each person coming through. This is, um, Mr. Michael was just a really good process. I don't know if you got to the individual schools, but as a parent, um, it felt like there was minimized risk um, in those situations. So I'm you know, definitely confident that you all work out the details for the 150 in the six schools. Um, two questions. I think one of them, first of all, great job in meeting a need, um, being very um, considerate, of, considerate of what these learning centers look like, working out all the details um, that you have. Um, I don't know if you mentioned the other half of the staffing would be coming from I don't know if you're saying it was other community partners or there's still some hiring needs to happen for that other half of the staffing. And then also, why is um, 900 the magic number, knowing that that is just the tip of the iceberg? I don't, um, I'm gonna start with the latter question. I don't know that there, um, there is a magic number. I think that um, you know, we really wanted to make sure that um, we were being thoughtful. Um, this is a big project and we wanna make sure that we were thinking about the safe spaces for our students as all, and also the safety of our staff and our community as well. Um, and I do believe that this is just the beginning as we work with our conveners and other spaces that will be available within the community. Um, and then I think I forgot your first question as I was answering the latter. Where are the other half of the teachers coming from? The other half, not teachers, but um, staff supervising the students. Yep, I apologize. So we do have our community ed staff that have volunteered. There is a possibility that we'll have more community ed staff as we begin. That was from our initial poll. Um, we are going to have this as an opportunity for some of our other staff at our schools, which would include um, many of our instructional assistants. This could be an opportunity if they would like to come and support our learning centers. And then we have been in contact with our institutions of higher education um, at Central and Duke University in particular have reached out. They have many students that either part of the coursework that they have or part of um, their work that they're doing with volunteers. And so there is um, a pretty good network of volunteers from, from them that would potentially be willing. And then the HOPE Network is also collecting volunteers as well. Ms. Atkins will um, partner with us in terms of our volunteer screening. And so what we will do is of course build up as we get um, our applicants in and assigned to make sure that we have the appropriate staff. There is the possibility that we would have to hire staff um, to make sure that we meet the need of the students that we need to serve and then that would adjust your programmatic cost. Um, there's one thing that I did forget to mention and I truly apologize and I um, can also yield um, to Dr. Monk. The reason I forgot to mention it is because we have been working so hard in the past few days to, um, to really make sure that we have all the details. We are going to be able to provide transportation for our learning centers and we will be able to provide transportation in a hub format. So we've been working very closely just in the past 48, 72 hours, um, Mr. Vidalia and Ms. Super Edwards with Mr. Harris. And so we, that is going to also help our families and they will be able to know on the application if transportation is needed. And I apologize um, that it was not in um, my initial talking points because we really have just um, figured that out in the past day or so. That's okay. Just proves to me you're a mind reader. That was gonna be my next question <laughs> about transportation. So I'm glad to hear that as well. And then I know you're not asking for um, support from the board as far as how many free slots there are. Um, that is one of my major concerns. I'm assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it depends on what your application pool looks like, but say there are 600 families that have need for free spaces. Is there ability to move up from where we were for free spaces or is there truly going to, is, is there going to be a cap? So I, what we want to make sure that we do is that we assign um, spaces based on those priorities. And so that's why I wanted to share with you how those spaces are going to be allocated. And um, the top two priority being families that are in transition um, and families that um, 
have qualified for free or reduced price meals. The reason I did provide you with the scenarios is I, I wanna be transparent with the board, knowing that um, there is anticipation of an update. And if you direct us to move forward using those priorities, I wanted you to be aware that um, as we move forward, there could be the potential that we would not net revenue with this particular program. And so I just wanna make sure that we're being honest and thoughtful about the cost that we would incur um, your direction tonight is going to give us um, the permission and the direction to launch the application and to follow your guidance around prioritizing those seats. And I, I hope that makes sense. Um, I did. Okay. I, that's interesting, Dr. Hardy. I, I think I wondered if, if in conversations with the commissioners um, going forward, if the county were to able to support this more whether we'd be able to expand it more quickly. And it sounds like that might be possible um, if we could dream that with them, because um, we definitely have a lot of need in the community. Ms. said, I'm sorry, I started talking right over you. Um, that's okay. Um, Dr. Hardy and your team, thank y'all for putting this together. We really did charge you with this probably a couple weeks ago. And so you were able to put together this I do have a question about um, just like need. Do we have a sense around number of need? I think I've heard some people in the community say a 3000 number, but I'm not sure, you know, if we have a sense yet of what the need is on this. I'm not sure that we have a, a comprehensive sense of the need um, and working very closely with our conveners. Um, they have identified a target of 3000 spaces for students across the city and county for public school students. And, um, but that is a partnership. So that is um, hope learning sites that would be uh, DPS sites, as well as learning centers that would be in the community, that there would be 3000 spaces um, available. Um, I think we will be able to um, start to identify a, the need as we collect applications in the form that we submitted we did receive um, well over 800 student potentials from the form that we launched, and that was just focusing on K-5. And so um, I do think there is a need to say exactly what that need is. I, I don't have enough data to share that, um, but the conveners are looking towards having 30, excuse me, 3,000 um, slots. Ms. Bai, can I make a comment here? Yes, please. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, this particular endeavor, I think, is going to take a community effort. Um, as we sing across the nation, there are faith based communities and other places as well. They're stepping in and try to help as well. I have been involved in a conversation with uh, folks at the city as well as the county level as well. It's going to take all of us to make this happen. Can you just imagine? Uh, we have six schools or six sites that we're able to open. If we have to open up more than that, that means that's gonna take care of pretty much most of our schools, where we're trying to bring our teachers to be able to teach remotely. And then if we have to bring our students, that means we're on plan B already. So uh, I'm, for those who are watching us and I'm asking our faith-based communities and our other folks as well, it's gonna take really a village concept for us to be able to make this happen. Uh, also, just want to remind folks, being really transparent, as we go through this COVID and we don't really know what revenue is going to be, we only have $8.3 million fund balance. So we're going to need every penny for 21-22 school year. Uh, we just waive fee for our pre-K, which close to $60,000. And based on the plan that Dr. Hardy just presented to you, and there are going to be more to come as well as we're dealing with this COVID. So I just wanted to put it up there that uh, I'm asking our community to be able to step in and uh, try to support us in this particular endeavor. Thank you, Dr. Mavinga. I, I did note that these budgets are really, unless I'm reading them wrong, they're projections for the first nine weeks or seven weeks of operations. So, you know, to run the entire academic year. I saw... I saw Ms. Faladarius come off um, and then Ms. Umstead. Um. Yes, um, I, I did, uh, you know, uh, just appreciate like 
the efforts and, and realizing the limitations. And I, I just wanted to check. I have um, three questions, but the one with um, how many how many staff um, were missing right now? One hundred and twenty something. I thought I heard Dr. Hardy. And so, um, so this this also brings me to what I'm seeing right now um, in terms of trends in the in, in you know uh, the community where you need an additional 124 staff members. 124, yes. Um, so there are there are the state is funding community health workers. The the state is uh, providing funds, and I think uh, Medicaid has like 28 different criteria. Um, I think transportation is included. So I'm wondering, like, to what degree this is a partnership with the state would like, you know, as much as we can leverage the kind of things that some of our families um, do have access to. Um, I know that there's 20 criteria in terms of like um, Medicaid used to only look at some things, but now they're op they've opened up to different things, including food, including transportation. And uh, this, the state has, has been partnering with, um, with folks for community health workers who essentially could do um, who are trained, who could keep us safe in terms of like monitoring for COVID symptoms, because anytime we have people in person in a building, um, there has to be that, that training as to like how to, how to um, minimize exposure and spread. Um, and so just, just putting it out there that having the fact that we already need 124 and that maybe we, we do need to think outside of the, the normal, you know, um, or outside of the box in, in so many ways and, and leverage as many resources, including, you know, um, you know, health, health workers. Um, and in this case, you know, there, there's this model of community health workers that, um, that, that could, could, could support us. And of course, community partners and as many different people as Dr. Mubenga um, stated, you know, we do need community support, but I'm thinking that having that focus for people that are, that are trained, that um, can understand like, you know, how to navigate COVID response and also like are providing, could provide transportation, um, could help us with those, with, with those things, especially for the, for the, um, for the needs that our kids have, you know, um, I'm thinking that there are some funds from the state that we, we should look into. Thank you very much for that. Ms. Umstead and then Mr. Sears. Thank you. Um, so we just had this conversation about transportation y'all just had. So that cost is not included in what we're talking about right now. And then when you talk about supplies and materials, what is included in that and what is maybe not included? Like are the costs around cleaning and sanitizing also included in what you presented to us around the budget? I will defer to Dr. Monk to share what some of those costs um, would be in operationalizing the six centers. And I recognize these might be estimates as literally y'all just did this yesterday. Yeah, so um, I won't even attempt to talk about um, the costs associated with transportation because we don't even know which students are going to be attending and where they're going to be attending from. Um, but what we do know is that um, this is more of a deference of um, savings that could have been realized um, by operating completely in, um, in Plan C. Um, so because we're going to be um, consuming goods, uh, we estimate that cost to be um, for the, the total nine weeks, about $50,000 for the consumables. Those are your sanitation and disinfecting type uh, products, as well as, uh, you know, paper towel and soap and things like that. And then if you look at the amount of um, labor that's going to need to be there for the constant di disinfecting for those uh, spaces, comes about $95,000 for that labor for the nine weeks. So all total as relates to um, the custodial operations at the site, which is brought about by um, COVID-19, those requirements is $146,000 um, we're estimating for the nine weeks for all six sites. Of course, the more sites that you open up, um, the more cost that you're gonna actually incur um, with those items. So if we add that 146 to, let's say we had 450 free sites, we're looking at over a half a million dollars that are not that we are expending that are not saved. And 
we don't have money allocated already to this, right? Like this was money that would come from our fund balance or is there another line item that we are thinking about this money coming from? The answer can be just, it's coming out the fund balance. <laughs> it's coming out of our fund balance, which is our savings. And I, and I asked those questions and I know that we have this need in our community. I think I'm also just concerned about our own budget um, as a district and what we spend this year, I think, as revenues are decreasing across the Durham County, across the state, I have fully believe there will be some cuts coming in the upcoming year. Um, and so I think I want the public to hear that. People who have access to funds in the community, what can you do to help us make sure we meet this need for our students? Um, but it, it, it does raise a little bit of a red flag for me. Um, and also I recognize how much our students and families need this. We are a district with 60% free and reduced lunch students. Um, having more free slots is gonna be the best option for us, um, but it does concern me around this budget um, item. And then I just, one question around staffing, are we thinking that the 124 would be volunteers or are we also thinking about there will be some hired staff in there as well? Cause I know that wasn't included I'm still talking about money, I'm sorry, y'all, um, in that budget revenue. Would the goal be mostly volunteers or we're not sure yet? I think we are optimistic that there are going to be some of our, our current DPS staff that are going to support and, and then we will have volunteers. Um, I don't want to, um, to make a promise that we will not have to hire additional staff. Um, we're gonna do our best to, to follow um, and to meet the parameters that we have shared with you this evening. I saw Mr. Lasore come off of mute and then I need to get Matt as well, but um, Paul, you had something to add. I'm, I'm going to defer to Matt because he has been trying. Mr. Sears has been trying to get into the picture. And then oh, yeah. I'm, you're, you're so kind, but I think my question relates to you as well and, and dovetails with Bettina. Um, I, I do want to talk about the budget because um, <laughs> having been on this board for six years and having gone through a reduction in force process that was economically driven, um, we're not using those words a lot in this economic crisis. And, and we're doing everything we can to avoid using those words. And I'm glad we are. And yet we haven't seen the state or the federal resources come to help us with that. So I'm gonna, I, I apologize, I'm gonna steer us. This is maybe the first one where you know, I'm going to ask about those 104 staff members in community ed. And it, for them, is this a, this is your job? And if they are not willing to take that, is this a, your job is going away because of the economics? I don't know who answers that question for me. Well, I certainly don't want to answer that question. I'll go to Ms. Umstead's question. <laughs> oh, can I ask one budget question too before you answer? Sure. So, because this is also on the on lines of budget. Um, you know, we just cut out 56,000 um, waiving pre K fees, and we're looking at deficits that are coming down the line. I think about um, community education and that funding, knowing that some of it is based on what families pay, and another part, I'm wondering is being subsidized, will we be getting any subsidizing money in? Um, for our community education work that's happening, or is that just null and void also, if that makes sense? Okay. Uh, um, the money, of course, is always an issue. Um, we're gonna leverage all the CARES Act money we have that we're receiving to offset some of these costs. Um, we will try to get reimbursements for some of the expenses that we will have for uh, cleaning supplies, so on and so forth. Uh, we're going to try to utilize all our dollars that we have in front of us before going into fund balance. I don't want to go into fund balance. We're going to try uh, the team to make this work with the funding that we have for this fiscal year. Some of it we only have till December 30th in a lot of the CARES Act funds. So we're going to try to try to use those dollars to support the programs and other people that, such as if they're in some instructional assistance that are gonna be part of this program, and they're not gonna be working with uh, classroom instruction, but they'll be working at these centers, we can use that as, as, as Dr. Hardy said, we could use those dollars 
to pay those people too. So we're looking at all the pots of money to make that work. Yeah, it, it's gonna be difficult, but we're gonna to try to do everything we can to minimize uh, and not go into fund balance. I appreciate that, Paul. I don't think Matt's question got answered, and I think that's a really important yeah, one. Is it, is it for Ms. Atkins or Ms. Hardy? Um, what, what are those folks' options? How is this being articulated to them? So I'm going to start and then definitely can have Ms. Atkins or, or Dr. Danner. One of the things that um, we shared with you at the end of our um, Plan C presentation, it was either at the last meeting or maybe two meetings ago, is that we had really worked collaboratively across offices to make sure that we had clear roles and responsibilities for all of our employees while they were while we were working remotely. And so during the COVID closure, we worked very closely with Dr. Danner and his team to provide um, professional learning. There were specific tasks and work that our community ed folks had to um, that they completed just like tasks that teachers and other staff were completing um, so that they were able to continue to be compensated. We surveyed our community ed staff to, to see which the staff that would feel comfortable given the current conditions to come into the building. And that is where, um, that is how we came to the 104 community ed staff. So those are the staff that will be coming into the building. We will, our plan is to continue what we did with um, during COVID closure and to make sure that we are providing um, opportunities and tasks for those other employees so that they could um, still continue to work in a remote environment and get compensated. Um, and I will yield to Dr. Danner or Ms. Atkins if um, there have additional pieces to add. I hope that answers your question. It does, and, and forgive me for, for asking it so tersely. I, I didn't take the five minute break, so I haven't moved in four and a half hours. Um, I, 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 I could have wrapped it in and, and should have that, you know, we have been doing everything we can to keep our people employed, um, getting paychecks, and, and I know that. Um, <clears throat> without continued infusion of funds, I'm worried that we need to start talking about reduction in force which is code for layoffs and um, and continuing to push what what few levers we have to try to get those with more power than us to um, support that I, I know we have local partners but um, but this is this is the pandemic of a century here and um, if if we just continue with status quo we're gonna have to make some hard choices pretty soon I'm afraid and I think it's going to be in one of these sort of ancillary pockets where, you know, they typically have their own um, revenue streams that, that are coming in um, and they try to operate, you know, budget neutral. So thanks for taking that question. I, I know this is hard um, and, and I do want to know how, how we're communicating with our people. So thanks for that. These are tough times and these are tough topics and this is tough work. Um, Mike, I see your hand. Yes, it's a subtle. Okay, I'm going to be very, very quick here. I, I don't really have any specific question. I just want to say thanks for putting this together. All right. So, you know, when we when we were talking about Plan C, uh, I mentioned the idea of having some spaces where we can uh, there's some safe spaces for our, our kids. All right. Some people didn't like that idea. In fact, I was attacked for it. So I really appreciate you guys giving the opportunity for uh, giving the opportunity for some of our staff to you know continue to work for in, in the buildings. If you're able to go into the buildings to provide you know a safe place for kids who who do not have safe places, working with community partners, working with other groups to make this happen. You guys have really put together a good program. I enjoyed seeing what I saw. There's a lot of work that has been done in the last few weeks to get this together. And there's no small, this is no small feat, especially when we're going to have to include transportation. So I just want to appreciate you guys, you know, for everything that you're doing. This, this even just the six buildings is going to provide relief for a lot of people, a lot of people. And it's not about making money. It's about providing these places 
for kids to go who need a safe place, safe place to learn. So I really appreciate what you guys are doing. I really like the idea and thank you all very much for this. Thank you, Mike. I see Ms. Amshad. This is related a little off topic. I say I'm a family that has means and I'm looking at these streams and I would like to pay for another student to be able to go. Like I'm thinking about how can we make sure that we can afford some spots for free students? Who do I talk to to get, like, is that an ask? Is that something that we can and be thinking through um, to be able to, to get more slots? I think that I can work with um, Dr. Danner and Mr. Sutter to, um, as well as Mr. Lesseur, if we want um, to have opportunities for someone to sponsor um, a family. Um, um, if you, the application is by week, so there could potentially be an option for you to sponsor a, a family per week um, or child per week. And so we can definitely explore that as an opportunity. Um, and I'll work with Dr. Danner and Mr. LaShore and Mr. Sutter um, to explore that option. Fresh off the press, the foundation is also doing some work around providing some free seats. So, thank you. I, I, the, I, this might, yeah, I'm just, just a second, Alexander, I come right to you. This might be related or it might be um, different, but when you look at the scenarios, the way I'm trying to think about it is if we have half paying students, does that mean that we can offer more free spots? I mean, essentially, whoever, Paul, Alex, who's done the modeling, like who can tell us, you know, I'd like all the slots to be free if we have 900, but if we do 450 now and we get 450 free students, does that let us continue to, to recruit 450 more paying students and serve more free students in, in the coming expansion? I mean, I don't even know if that's, if I'm making sense with that question, but the model, the model that we are, the scenarios that we provided tonight, would it require us to go beyond the six sites? And so we will have to make that determination that would be based on what Dr. Mabinga has just said about keeping our facilities uh, safe for our teachers so they can come in and do their work. So that would have caused us to move definitely into plan B. So we would have to think about how we expand those sites. That 150 was based on 900 students, based on survey data that we sent out early at the beginning of this request. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm thinking of it as, as a modeling scenario. And, and if we recruit plenty of paying families, that lets us grow the program in my mind if we need it longer. But, but y'all have fresher math minds than mine. Um, just keep it in mind. And I, I'd also like and hope that one of the risk criteria that we have in there in triaging students is, is foster children. I don't know if I heard that one, Dr. Hardy, in your list, but um, those are that that group of children fits in that first scenario. So any family that is in in transition is the broad term that we use because um, oftentimes there are situational circumstances and they might be in the process of qualifying for McKinney Vento or there could be other extenuating circumstances. So it, it does include our foster families, our most vulnerable students, students that are in transition and students who may qualify for um, McKinney Vento services. So that's that first priority um, of students that will be um, that will be serving. Thank you so much. Ms. Yes, I, I, I like that, um, that line of thinking in terms of like being able to have spots where parents can pay. Um, just wanted to bump up again um, I don't know what the algorithm is going to be in terms of placement, but again, like um, when we think about free or reduced lunch, we know what those numbers look like across the district. We have quite a few families that qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, most of our schools are, you know, Title I schools. And so that criteria alone um, would already take up all the 900 spots. And for me, it's like, how do we ensure that we are uh, being very strategic and, and because there's limited spots that there's like whether it's like a, a combination of factors. I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking about the moms that I've talked to who um, have cried on the phone, have told me, you know, my child needs to see somebody that, you know, can, um, needs to be in, a, in, in an environment, right? Needs to be in a space that, um, that, that, that will allow them to learn. And especially for kids that have EC needs. So I'm really thinking I'm really bumping up EC 
I'm bumping out the kids that need to have like, you know, the, the, the interaction, um, the supervision, because working parents, I mean, giving, giving the kids who have these special needs um, to just, you know, have a babysitter um, or it's, it's not the same thing as being um, as a kind of services that they were receiving. I think they're the ones that are hurting the most. Um, everybody's hurting right now. Everybody is. And I'm not trying to say, um, but, but when I think about the moms who have told me what COVID has meant, and it's meant for many kids to not get the therapies that they need. And it's not the same to get therapy over a screen, you know, and it is not the same to have, you know, to be able to pick up on the cues. There are many different cues that you can't pick up, especially for some of these sensory um, spectrum. Um, and so when I think about that, I'm just wondering if there's an algorithm that will not just make it A or B, but will make it even a combination. If you have A and B, like if you're free to reduce lunch and you're EC, like, you know, you have an IEP. Um, or even parents who are willing to pay, you know, there, there are many parents who are willing to pay who have those, those, uh, those uh, special, special requests that their child needs to see, um, you know, needs, needs to have the supervision um, and to be seen. So I know this is like a big, a big feat. I'm just really thinking if there's a way that we can have an algorithm or some kind of thing where it's like, it's a combination of factors. And we are, um, with the limited spots that we have, trying to, trying to, um, provide those spaces for those children that really need need to have that. Absolutely. And I think one of the um, that's one of the reasons we have worked to make sure that there are explicit questions on the application so that we can see um, potentially the multiple needs that many of our families will have. And so that will help us um, with the board's direction um, if there is guidance this evening and approval for us to use those priorities that we mentioned. I do also just want to make a, a point of clarification, and um, Dr. Pittman is here who can represent um, uh, Ms. Ryerson regarding ESL services, and I know Dr. Bell was on earlier, um, and so I, I want there just to be a little bit of clarification as we are trying to make sure that we service our most vulnerable students, that this is not operationalizing Plan B. This is not school. This is providing a safe space for our students to learn and their services are going to be facilitated through the operation, for example, of their IEP, our exceptional children's teachers and our exceptional children uh, instructional assistants. So I, I just want to make sure that um, there's not an expectation that because a child, um, one of our students with special needs or other children that we are gonna be operationalizing and executing their IEP in these spaces, that is coming from our teachers and we're providing learning through plan C. And, um, but at the same time, I understand the need that I'm hearing from many of the board members to ensure that we have a safe space because what we know is if we're meeting social and emotional needs, it helps our children with their academic needs, given the many needs that our community has. And so I did wanna make that point of clarification. Um, I can scroll to see if, um, I'm not sure, I do see uh, Ms. Saunders. Oh, I actually see Ms. Ryerson. So I, I want to make sure, I don't know if Dr. Bell has had to step off. Um, and I would, if any of our, um, if Dr. Pittman or any of our other staff want to clarify if, if, um, if there was something that I left out. No, Dr. Hardy, I think you did a wonderful job. We are making sure that on the application for particularly our families that are new to the United States and do have English language support needs that Ms. Ryerson out of the uh, English as a Second Language Department is gonna be collaborating with the learning centers to support those students. And Ms. Saunders, on behalf of EC, I see you, you're here, thank you. And you have anything that you'd like to add? Well, I think Dr. Hardy was, was pretty clear. We'll be executing the IEPs with, through the schools and not through the learning centers. So that would be completely separate from that. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you for your patience with us tonight. It's a long, long time to get to your agenda item, but it's super, super important. Any other thoughts and, and questions? And since we did have a public comment about the thinking behind the DPS staff, right? Can you guys uh, share your thinking about that before we 
move on. Our, um, one of the things that we do wanna make sure that we are able to provide is high quality, engaging social, emotional, and academic learning for our children during remote, um, during our plan C. We wanna make sure that um, many of our staff um, have multiple children and we wanna make sure when they are um, providing that synchronous instruction to um, children in our community that um, if this is a service that they need, that they can take advantage of this service so that they can teach and connect with the children in their classroom. Um, and just wanting to make sure that that is an option because we have such a commitment to making sure that the remote learning that you see is engaging, it's meeting the needs of our students, it's addressing their social and emotional well-being, and they can do so without any distraction because we know how much they want to do that and they do that every day um, and they wanna be able to give, but many of them as well have their own, own children and this would um, allow them to give to the children in Durham Public Schools. Thank you for that. Um, any other comments? This is an item that is here for action and a really important item this evening. Everyone looks as content as they can look at 940 in the evening. Really appreciate it. I think we, I would welcome a motion. Okay, so I'm actually looking at the agenda trying to figure out how to, what are we supposed to, what are we approving here? Uh, what actually are we approving? So um, we are asking that you um, approve for the administration to move forward with the implementation of six learning centers. Okay, I move that we compel the administration to move forward with the DPS learning centers. Can we turn the prioritization part of it as well that was presented? And the prioritization. What about the scenarios? I mean, you presented three, uh, mm -hmm. one that had registration for all students, one that did, didn't have it and had, you know, the numbers. So is that, is that not, we're not going to vote on which scenario tonight? I mean, is that something that I guess we can follow up on? We will definitely make sure to provide you with updates. Um, I would like for you to allow us the flexibility given the prioritization that you've given to us to make sure that we're meeting your guidance and that we um, would not be held to a specific um, number for each group. You've given us the prioritization and we will um, do our best to implement that prioritization with the guidance that the board has provided. Yeah, I apologize. I thought that was all part of it, but I didn't know we had, I didn't, think we have to do a separate, do we have to do a separate motion for that or are we adding that in there? Okay, I was just making sure because yeah, I thought it was all built in. So that's my motion as presented. I second your motion, Mike. It's been, yeah, I see, um, it's been moved by Mr. Lee and seconded by Ms. Lewis and I see comment, uh, question from Mr. Sears. Discussion, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm torn here. Um, there is a threshold where we have to do something and, and this may be the something and cases are trending down um, in our community, which, which I think is great. Um, I, I, I'm just really torn about, you know, if uh, about the employee piece, about the safety piece. Um, uh, I, I, you know, doing this for our most vulnerable students is, is a good thing in terms of supporting the families. And, and, and you know, the, there's strong, there's a strong rhetorical argument for that. This is the guinea pig um, program. And I, I worry about the health effects, um, but I'm not a health expert. Um, I, sorry to, to, you know, just babble on about this, but I, I think I'm going to abstain, which I know is a de facto yes vote. Um, I'm just not confident this is the right move at this time. Dr. Mbengo, did you come off mute? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I saw you. It's not my habit to contradict any board member, but I just wanted to add another piece. Uh, 
Uh, the number is trending down, that's correct. But when it comes to our school age student, 5 to 18, uh, the infection rate is 19%. So I just wanted to put it out there. So it's still bad among our school age students, 19%. Yes, Ms. Amstead. Yeah, I, I still feel a little torn as well. Um, I'm wondering, and I, and I say that with knowing that this is a need, right? So I, I want to be clear that I understand the equity concerns around this um, and why we're doing it. I wonder if there's a way that we, um, do we do 100 students in, in every building instead of 150 and, and, and there are ways, like you said, Mr. Sears, like we're testing to kind of see what this looks like. Is that give us a, a little bit of a better, um, a smaller group that we're working with? Or I, actually, I think what I'm really saying is I would really like really regular updates on this of how many students are enrolling, how many are requesting free spots, what we're looking like as we partner with community around safety. Um, because I'm excited and I know the need is there, but I also, it just makes me a little nervous. I wonder if we might um, pass this with you all adding some health metrics um, that you're working on with the Duke and UNC team um, that would put specifics in place. And I think I shared with some of you, I don't think I shared it with all of you, the Cambridge Public Schools model has three health metrics that they've identified in working with their researchers that might be good ones to start and look at. And they, what I like about that model is it shows when, if specific metrics go up, when it's time to stop and go full remote, when things can close as well as when they can open. Um, and that's the piece I think that um, Matt and, and Bettina are having some concerns about and that, that we need to actually delineate for families because these may be able to open on the 17th and the 24th or they might not be able to open until September, October. I mean, we I think without that piece, it doesn't feel like we've done full due diligence. Um, um, we're um, definitely in a just um, between a rock and a hard place with the decisions that are having to go forward. And I think that um, this, this administration team was asked to come back with a plan that highlights minimizing risk and keeping our numbers low. And that's what they came back with. I, um, I'm hesitant because just in, in this space and time, there's hesitation with everything. And I'm also um, willing to move forward with this plan because it has present, been presented and a lot of folks have, have had um, contributed to what this will look like, how this can look. So with that, I'm, I would also echo what Chair Umstead said and having regular updates and knowing these metrics and letting our community know these metrics because I think that will help to decrease our anxieties. But again, having a clear plan that you all have vetted and have brought to us and would like action for that, um, even in my hesitation, I am ready to move forward with it. Um, I wanted to, yes, thank you. Um, you know, this is an opportunity for us to uh, put into place things. I mean, one thing is to have the data and to have like the information, but then what are we doing about the information that we get? So we do know that there's a 19% rate, which means that, you know, the, the risk is there that, you know, that there's going to be um, students with symptoms that we are going to have staff, staff that are going to be exposed. So how are we preparing? How are we setting it up? And that's where I'm, I'm, I'm saying that there's already um, funds that are there, like, workers that are already being paid where DPS wouldn't have to pay, but there are people who are trained to deal with symptoms, to understand flow charts and isolation protocols, um, who are, have already been deployed to different nonprofits throughout Durham. So they're, they're already community 
health workers in different uh, institutions right now. Um, some charters are looking into that as well. So it's like, you know, can we can we like make the case to set up these uh, spaces with the personnel that that is able to help us mitigate or help us monitor, um, have have the, the setups in place. So it's it's great to have the data. It's great to see the trends. It's great to see the numbers and to understand what the risks are. But then we have to have um, a framework. We have to have flow charts. We have to have like um, people on the ground, people that are present who know what to do. Um, if you know a child has three out of seven symptoms, you know, or two out of seven, or if you know somebody's coughing, what what does that mean? You know, it's like somebody who's who can really have um, can, can can guide the processes that are going to have to happen in, in these buildings because the reality is that the risk is there. Um, and so, yeah, just just uh, putting that out there that. Right now, there are models, there are um, funds that are coming from the state that you know we can we can figure out if, if some of these folks can help us as we're setting up these centers, so we can set them up responsibly and with the considerations of vulnerable populations that have been impacted disproportionately by COVID, um, marginalized communities that have um, fared worse than anybody else um, because this 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 virus has done that. So, um, to Matt's point, you know. Let's, let, let, let's make sure that we protect and, and we, we set it up in, in a very responsible, very considerate way with, with, the, with the health. I agree with, with Natalie in that sense that we have to take into account health. Where are these people though? Where, where are the people that you speak of? I mean, there's, there's far too little and far too many demand. It's already spread out. They're nowhere to be found because they're already They've talked dry. To, they're, they've come to present to us. Know, well, I mean, they've talked to to to. So there is a, a group, um, the Pandemic Response Network. So at Duke, they have an app. Um, they have developed an app that Duke students. So I, as a Duke employee that I am, I have to be logging in my symptoms two weeks before I even set foot into Duke. It's it's the monitoring. It's the responsibility I have to have as somebody who is going to pose exposure, like a risk, even by stepping into a building. So two weeks before. I have to be doing like some monitoring and they already have developed the app. It's, it's already there. They have been sharing the data. So if, if you go on Twitter and all that, I can send you that information, but they have talked to, uh, to our DPS admins and they have, you know, shown the app. The app is already being used um, by Duke. And so, and they are working in collaboration with the four, uh, they have, they have shared data with the four doctors that came to present. So there's two arms to this. There's the research arm and it's a research framework. And then there's a services, there's the boots on the ground. This is the kind of thing that is like, in the, into the weeds and developing tools for us to be able to use. So it's like the two different components and they're very important because one thing is it's going to tell us the trends and it's going to give us guidance as to when to close a school, but then we have to have the tools and we have to have the setup that is going to help us ensure that teachers are armed with, you know, equipment, with, with, with a tool, with an app where they can um, do their own monitoring and feel safer because they're like, okay, um, and, and, and it's also going to help families, too, because as they're tracking their own symptoms and it's going to tell them like, you know, green, like almost like a stoplight, like you should not you should not show up to the building today. Like every morning you kind of do this because you're being responsible because we have to take care of each other. And so it'll it'll like have like a little like, no, today you should not. You should you actually need to go seek medical care or, or seek medical attention. There's more to it. But I think that there's this 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 uh, tools. like these. Yeah, and and the workers would, would be super helpful. And we're saying that we want, we're looking for the students to do this as um, monitoring, not, as a recording, all of that kind of thing. Is that what we're saying? They're not students. No, these are people, the community health workers. It's a model. They're, they're trained. They're trained and they go through, through trainings and to be able to, to navigate times of COVID. So the, the state has funds for it. They have their own training that they have to go through. And these are people based in community. So there's there's relationship and there's trust. And so um, the model comes with, like I said, there's tools and then there's also the people like the workers and they have been approved. So right now you, 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 can, you can talk to the folks at Duke. They have come to talk to, to um, they have to come to talk to, to DPS. And so I would say like, that's, I don't know if, if, if I would, I would move. I don't know if you guys want to have like a presentation. I think it would be, beneficial to have them kind of speak about how that works, the community health workers, the app and the tools so so we can have both components, the research and the programming and the services. 
I understand that. I just, I thought you said that you had to monitor your own symptoms. And I was just wondering if you were saying that our students would have to monitor our own systems in the app. And yeah, like an so it would be kind of coming up. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Like, it's like the attestation form that we talked about where before, like, like I mentioned, before I even go into Duke, like I have to be, like I, I, I open an app and I, I click on, you know, what is happening today. If I have nothing, then I have nothing to click and I'm good. But if I start showing something, then I click, you know, it's like I, I cough today or I sneezed, you know, I'm, I have a fever and it'll immediately, it has already the algorithm that'll tell me, no, you, 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 you can't, you can't show up to the building today. And so um, it is like an attestation form, like the, the thing we're going to have where folks are going to have to answer some questions before they set foot into a space or be allowed into a space. Like it's, it's, it's to that level. Okay. I think, I think that can be something we can explore, but I don't want to try to solve that uh, tonight, but I definitely think that's something, I think Dr. Mabinga has been in contact with the pandemic response network. Um, and we definitely, I mean, we're going to need all the support that we can have with trying to move forward with any type of in-person learning centers, instruction, et cetera. So thank you, Alexander. Yeah, thank you. So uh, last I heard, we did have a motion and a second. And I kind of tried to make it a friendly amendment to it about metrics. I don't know if that was accepted or not. Um, because that would give me some help with some of my unreadiness. And I was trying to help Matt's and Bettina's as well. Um, any other thinking on this? I think we've, um, we've gone around uh, quite a bit. Our staff's been very patient. Are we ready for a vote? Are we voting on an amended motion or the motion that was put forth? I didn't amend my motion. Was I was I supposed to? So oh, I was trying to offer an amendment about our staff putting in actual metrics that would that would help um, guide when these are ready to open and when they might need to close. But you know, as part of their next steps before we move, you know, all the way forward. That health metrics piece. But it's up to you whether you would accept that amendment or think that is valid. I'll accept it. I'll accept it. So we'll, okay. it can, it can be, it doesn't have to be re-seconded. We can, we can just accept it as a friendly amendment. Any other further discussion? If not, are we ready for the vote? Thank you all for all your input. Um, Ms. Lewis. Hi. Ms. Umstead. Hi. Mr. Lee. Hi. Mr. Sears. I'm abstaining. Ms. Valladares. Aye. And I vote aye as well. It passes. However, Mr. Malone scores that with an abstention. Um, five, one, five, six, zero. I don't know how that goes. I mean, you, you <laughs> noted it as an abstention, but it technically would count as an affirmative vote, typically. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and actually, I think that brings us back to the Title IX policy issue with you, Mr. Malone, and, and Ms. Giovanni, if we're still. Yeah, if I would, if we could table it until after the closed session and then have a short attorney client discussion on it in closed. Um, I do envision that you'll do something in open session that related to it. Thank you very much. And then that brings us to uh, do we summary of follow up items. I think Dr. Is this, is this me? Okay. Um, Dr. Monk, may I ask a clarifying question? I just want to make sure that we understand the board's direction and um, of that motion. So the Feel motion, free, ask away. Thank you so much. The, the motion is for us to bring back to you metrics at the next meeting 
And then based on those metrics, you will determine if we are opening or moving forward. My amendment was just that you would incorporate those and based on your monitoring them would, would move forward or not, depending on what you all decide. I don't think it needs to come back to us. I never intended, but some said doesn't think that needed to come back to us. I, I just think it's a, a thermometer or that you all need to build into the model so that you will have it there. And, and does that make sense, Dr. Harney? Yeah. I think so. So we are moving forward with K-5 opening on the 24th and 612 opening on the 31st and then providing updates with metrics to the board. Unless the health metrics say alarming red, don't do it, then I would think y'all would use your judgment and not, right? I, I, I think I'm, I'm more clear now. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. We got it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I was looking at Dr. Ravinga saying, yes, I'm good. And I apologize for letting me clarify, Dr. Monk. Thank you. A lot of good work being done tonight. Um, next week, we're going to get that information out uh, to families uh, tomorrow about the orientation week for next week. Make sure there's equity um, as we go into um, starting true instruction. And then Dr. Mabanga is going to work with those early start schools um, to make sure they're also in a good place um, as it relates to devices and um, make sure their students are prepared for instruction as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Monk. Thank you all, everybody on both screens for all your patience and diligence in this these difficult, difficult times. I would welcome a motion to go into closed session for the reasons stated on the agenda. So moved. Um, it's been moved by Mr. Lee and seconded by Ms. Lewis that we go into closed sessions for the reasons stated on the agenda. Uh, Ms. Lewis, ready to vote? Or? Aye. Ms. Sumsted? Aye. Mr. Lee? Aye. Mr. Sears. Mr. Sears, I think you came off mute at the wrong time, sorry. Aye, aye, aye. aye. Perfect, thank you. Ms. Valladares. Aye. And I vote aye as well. We are in closed session, thank you all.
Kyle setting up the link now. He's ready. Do you need a countdown? Are we good? No, we're okay. He already started. Great. We are back in open session, board. Sasha Vavinga, do you have a personnel report? Yes, Ms. Bayer. Board members, so I'm here to ask for your blessings, your approval for personnel report as discussed at a closed session. Thank Move you. Approval, the personnel report. I'll second. It's been moved by Ms. Umstead and seconded by Mr. Lee that we approve the personnel report dated August 13th. Any further discussion? All in favor, Ms. Uh, Lewis. Aye. Ms. Umstead. Aye. Mr. Lee. Aye. Mr. Sears. Aye. Aye. Ms. Valladares. Aye. And I vote aye as well. It passes unanimously. Do we have um, a Title yes. IX issue, Ms. Giovanni? Yes. Uh, board members, um, administration at this time would like to withdraw its request that the board waive second reading given the complex nature of the new Title IX regulations and the extremely short time period that the board had to uh, review it, as well as myself and Mr. Malone, uh, we would like this to um, move to the next um, board meeting for uh, further consideration. Thank you so much, Ms. Giovanni. Do you need action this evening or will you just move that on consensus? No, just on consensus like we did before. We're just I'm withdrawing the request for the waiver. Great. I appreciate it. Thank you all for your patience. Thanks for bearing with us. And if there is no further business, I will call this meeting adjourned. Thank you all. Be safe. Bye, everybody. Bye everyone. Happy birthday.